A very warm good evening to all the August audience and our guests who are here with us today. It's a beautiful Sunday and uh, also marks the pre- uh, or the uh, Oral Cancer Awareness Month, where I can get along with uh, Sterling Cancer Hospital Foundation for Head and Neck Oncology is organizing the Oral Cancer E Conclave for the entire month. We are going to have four Sundays, which are full of wonderful scientific sessions for the audience and for. Uh, with uh, with the great academic content as well as great practical learning from prolific onco surgeons who are here with us today on this event and will address us and from whom we will have a wonderful opportunity to learn a lot of things i thank all the partnering organizations and the respective representatives who are here with us today who have been tirelessly working for the past uh, fortnight uh, to make this event really grand and successful i'm sure that today uh, there will be a lot of a lot of new uh, teachings lot of new ex- uh, experiences coming together on this forum on this program and now with this we move ahead uh, to the launch of our uh, scientific sessions this was the inauguration ceremony ladies and gentlemen and now we i'm very uh, glad to invite uh, dr uh, meenu walia who is also director of uh, clinical cancer care from max institute of cancer care she is a renowned cancer specialist with more than 30 years of experience in treating the cancer patients and is the first dnb from medical oncologists of india currently she spearheads the department of medical oncology and hematology at max institute she has been decorated with various awards namely the bharat jyoti award medical excellence by indian medical association multiple times she is a keen cancer researcher and is a principal investigator of various international clinical research trials she is the author of a popular book among cancer patients tips for happiness in the shadow of cancer and is a stellar speaker she is extremely inspirational and passionate about her work with this i now invite dr meenu ma'am on the forum to kindly give the opening address and launch the scientific sessions for the evening so oh, thank you shruti thank you for such a warm introduction my honor and my privilege to be a part of this team and to be a part of this forum we are as rightly said by my predecessors the who's and who of oncology the who's and who of this field are here i welcome you all today to the i can care oral cancer intrigues of oral cancer e conclave this is one of its kind e conclave that is going to be spread across a series of four online programs every sunday in this month in the month of april which is observed as the oral cancer awareness month many before me have already talked about oral cancer we know that it is a cancer which ranks amongst the top three types of cancer in our country and it is a significant public health problem we commonly witness the problem is not only related to this cancer alone but many things behind it whether it is tobacco and what not and even the problems posed in early diagnosis and the problems related to the treatment in our in countries like us so in our first session of the series we will be discussing about the various challenges the challenges which are involved in diagnosing these oral lesions and gives me immense pleasure to welcome the who's who of oncology all the esteemed speakers sessions would add value to our existing knowledge and the new learnings would turn out to be practical of any specific session of the e conclave open and over to Uh, we lost connectivity from uh, Meenu, ma'am. But I, uh, I, we heard I, uh, her address. And thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for inaugurating the scientific sessions. And with this, we move ahead with the first session. And I invite uh, Dr. Pooja again, who is uh, the senior consultant and head at Sterling, Ca- Sterling Cancer Hospital, to please uh, start the scientific sessions for the evening. Thank you, Shruti. So I think. Uh... Uh, the program is all set so we uh, without wasting much time i would uh, now start uh, with the first talk uh, the rules of this program are very simple that i would first of all request all the speakers to please be on time uh, i think it is uh, the first talk is by dr nishit soni uh, he is he did his uh, masters in dental surgery from the government dental college ahmedabad in 2006 and then he has served as assistant professor 
at the Kem Shah Dental College, Vadodara, Kanauti School of Dentistry, Gandhinagar, and Goenka Research Institute of Dental Sciences, Gandhinagar. After that, from since 2009, he's been doing private dental practice at the Denta Skull Dental Clinic, and he's been also associated with Tobacco Intervention Initiative Program of IDA since 2019. For this uh, session, for his talk, uh, I invite Dr. Prashant Shah, who will be the chairperson. Uh, he has completed, uh, the, Dr. Prashant Shah has completed his graduation from Government Dental College and Hospital Ahmedabad in 2003. Currently, he is working as a dental practitioner and owns his multiple dental clinics since 2004. He has been elected as president of IDA Varodara branch for the year 2019-2020 and also 2020-21 and also been member of IDA since the last 15 years and been serving the association at various posts. So without much delaying, I am now forwarding it to Dr. Prashant Sa for the further thing. Just a quick request to Dr. Prashant Sa that after the talk, you have to give your concluding remarks and we'll invite all the questions during the open house at 4.50. So over to you, Dr. Prashant Sa. Hello. Yes, you're audible, Prashant. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you all for uh, meeting me as the chairperson for this program. Actually, oral cancer uh, is uh, really a uh, we in very early stage. So, uh, just looking forward all the session and uh, uh, like concluding the program. I think we now forward it to Dr. Nishit Soni for his talk. Over to Dr. Nishit Soni. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, Shruti, can I sh uh, share my screen now? Yes, yes, sir, you can. Okay. So uh, this will be a very short, uh, I don't know whether in detail or an introduction about the oral premalignant lesions. Okay. So uh, without wasting time, we'll uh, begin with the, I have a short presentation. So we'll begin with the presentation. Uh, can I, uh, is it seen? No, so we can't see it now. It's not shared yet. Okay. Yes, now it's visible, sir. Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, my talk of today is oral lesion, benign versus pre-malignant uh, versus malignant lesions. So I would be covering a few uh, introductory things about the things because I have uh, seen uh, the rest of the lectures. Uh, they are covering clinical as well as the pathological aspect. So what I'll do is I, uh, begin, I'm beginning with some demographics. Uh, I'll cover with the potentially malignant uh, oral lesions. Now, this is just a quick uh, introduction about the demographics uh, of the uh, cancer uh, research conducted by, and this is basically a review conducted by National Institute of Cancer Prevention and Research published uh, uh, by them. And it uh, it comprises uh, of uh, these things that the oral cancer is about 10% uh, of the total cancer detected in females. And in males, it is about 16%. Uh, so it's quite a lot number. And uh, this data is quite uh, disturbing, uh, I would say. Because uh, about the glo uh, when when we consider uh, the oral cancer reported globally, it is eighty six percent of the total cases are reported just in India. So, uh, being a dental surgeon, being uh, uh, there are so many onco surgeons uh, in the list, I can see uh, this will be a big responsibility on them, on us, on any general practitioner to detect the lesion early. And as uh, uh, Sir said, uh, De Cruz Sir said, that about 40% uh, of the Indian population, uh, that is quite alarming. The 40% of the Indian population is uh, having uh, the habit of tobacco, and the two third of them, almost 66% of them, are almost uh, having uh, chewed tobacco. So that is quite alarming. Now, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> There are different terminologies. You know, this is not a theoretical lecture, but I would like to uh, highlight a little about uh, the uh, different terminologies which has been used in oral cancer since uh, ages. 
like pre-malignant lesions. I would not, of course, I'm not going to uh, go in detail about the definitions, but the lesions are the localized portion on the oral mucosa condition are generalized state. And uh, over a period of time, the research which has been conducted about, uh, uh, you know, defining these conditions uh, has changed because of uh, the research, the prognosis, and the treatment which has been carried out on the basis of that. So now the latest research, uh, research which has been published by WHO in 2021 uh, says that uh, we should consider they have got a list of lesions uh, which were previously classified as lesions, premalignant lesion, premalignant condition, or precancerous condition. Now they are calling it potentially malignant disorders. <clears throat> so oral potentially malignant disorders, what they name. The, uh, it is just a new name. Uh, the lesions remain the same. The diseases remain the same. Uh, so <clears throat> now uh, I always wonder that why uh, we are wasting our time in diagnosis. I, I'm sorry about uh, using the harsh word, but uh, it is a common question. You know, whenever in practice uh, the people uh, see a particular uh, patient with uh, some red or white patch, or some sort of difficulty in opening the mouth, and they, uh, you know, uh, either they ignore uh, because uh, they came for a different condition, <coughs> or they, uh, few of them are not having uh, enough uh, kind of knowledge to diagnose that lesion early. So I always wonder, you know, uh, previously when I was not associated with uh, intervention initiative by IDA, I was all, I, I always wonder in the beginning when I studied that why to waste our time. So later, over a period of time, when my uh, when I attended sessions, I uh, evolved. I would like to replace the word waste with utilize. That why we have to utilize the time in diagnosis of the lesion because. It's not about uh, uh, that uh, we diagnose the particular lesion in time. Like I don't operate the particular lesion, but at least I uh, play a little part in uh, diagnosis of uh, certain lesions. So uh, I would like to utilize my time in diagnosis. Why? Because uh, whenever we are treating a patient, you know, whenever we are performing a particular task, we are looking at some response from uh, the target community like when we are treating uh, if the patient is in good condition patient is having a good quality of life then we feel happy so that's what we do of course apart from the revenue generation that's what we do uh, for ourselves so basically uh, i would uh, uh, highlight a few point why uh, we have to give a little time in diagnosis of the lesion like early uh, detection means early treatment and i think that is the main motto of uh, uh, organizing such kind of events uh, moreover, in India, the financial cost to the patient matters a lot. Like there are so many patients out there which cannot afford the further treatment because of because, because of the finances also. Later, when they're treated, uh, uh, giving a, a proper rehab to the patient, uh, whether uh, we can put the particular patient in function after the treatment, that is also more important. So early detection means early treatment, and then we can uh, even uh, uh, rehab, uh, we can uh, give a good rehab to the patient or reconstruction to the particular patient All right so uh, uh, without wasting a time i'll just uh, this these are just a list of uh, uh, the pre malignant uh, oral potentially malignant disorder previously known as pre malignant lesions condition precancerous conditions so uh, i think most of us are aware of uh, about the terminology uh, in the last uh, research that uh, who has given they have uh, they have included two uh, particular uh, lesions in the category. The last two, the oral lichenoid lesion and oral graft versus horse disease uh, in the category of potentially malignant disorder. So basically, these ter this terminology, I understand from the research that these are the potentially malignant disorder that uh, when we see in our practice, we should go for either biopsy or a long, long follow-up. Right? If any changes are there, if any changes occur, uh, which... Uh, may alarm a particular condition, then they can go for a biopsy and further diagnosis, or they can refer to the specialist, of course, right? It is not possible for everyone to perform a biopsy in general practice or uh, uh, in dental practice. So they can refer to the particular specialist. Now, why these, you know, uh, whenever, whenever I'm looking for these slides, then I'm wondering why uh, why this like an early, like leukoplakia, erythroplakia, everyone is familiar of. Proliferative verrucous leukoplakia, of course, everyone is familiar of because this is the uh, one of the most dangerous uh, pre-malignant lesions previously supposed to be considered terminology. 
then oral submucous fibrosis, lichen planus, we are familiar. Why these lesions are added or they are considered as potentially malignant? Because, uh, you know, this is not only about the pathology. There are three factors that uh, are considered uh, to uh, diagnose a particular lesion as an oral prey malignant disorder. So that is one is long, long follow up. Uh, what they have done is they have compiled a number of research. They have done a long, long meta-analysis of the previous studies, and they have came to a conclusion that these are the lesion. Initially, they were diagnosed as benign, but now they are considered as malignant. So now put them in the category of oral pre-malignant disorder. It's the same thing. Whenever they have diagnosed the oral squamous cell carcinoma, the red and white patches are also found at the uh, periphery. So they have considered this as an oral pre-malignant. So these uh, and they may share a morphological and cytological changes observed in epithelial malignancy. So, and the last is any of the chromosomal, genomic, or molecular alteration. So, on the basis of this, they have classified this particular lesion as an oral pre-malignant lesion. Now, some of the clinical aspect which can correlate with the histopathology, I would like to identify. So, basically, oral mucosa, oral mucosa, whenever they are in different colors. So basically oral potential malignant disorders are divided into, or clinical aspects are divided into four parts, color, any different color is allowing. Why? Because normal oral mucosa is uh, coral pink in color. So whenever it is red, that means that the epithelium underlying is unable to produce its product. So that means the morphology is there. If they are producing more, then also again, it is a white lesion. Then again, any texture abnormalities like if I, whether it is a white plaque, white patch, that is also alarming. If they are not producing anything uh, on the top that is atrophic, that is also alarming. If they are producing mixture, uh, uh, they are producing a speckled appearance, then also it is alarming. So these are the consider uh, con consideration done for the texture of the oral mucosa. So any of these things is alarming uh, as a uh, to the clinician, and they can diagnose a particular lesion as an oral pre-malignant disorder. Not only this, the location, whether it is at the one location or another location, so that is also another. And variable clinical course means follow. Now, not all the red and white patches are diagnosed as uh, pre-malignant conditions. Now, I would consider this as a clinical pathological changes. I have prepared slide long back. But uh, I show this in most of the lecture that these, if you follow this, color and texture, it is the simplest form of uh, oral pre-malignant disorder diagnosis. If any changes in the color, you can, uh, you can suspect, not diagnose, suspect. And any change in the texture, you can suspect. So anything which is vertically, like red papillary, white exophytic, that is called as non-homogeneous lesion, and can consider, you can consider it for biopsy. Now... Uh, not only that, these are the clinical aspects, but you have to exclude certain lesion. If you, if you consider that previous uh, uh, definitions, always it is diagnosis by exclusion. So these are the lesions which are not considered for biopsy, right? White spawn nevers, keratosis, candidiasis, like acute pseudomembranous candidiasis or uh, chronic uh, hypoplastic candidiasis, lip biting or cheek biting lesions, chemical injuries like aspirin burns, leukoedema. It is just a change in the mucosa and these normal structures, podiasis spots, even oral hairy leukoplakia and HIV nicotine stomatitis due to smoking. So these are di basically diagnosis by exclusion. So now we have to compile these things. There are three things, clinical aspect, red, white, or different texture, histopathological aspect, which can correlate with the clinically and certain diseases which to exclude and certain evidences from the research, combining them they have given us the proper criteria for diagnosis for this oral potentially malignant disorder. So with this, I think uh, uh, I have solved the purpose of my talk. Uh, I would uh, like to conclude with the remark that uh, if any of the lesions with cer certain features of the color and texture, uh, changes in the color and textures are found, and if you can exclude these uh, uh, the previously stated lesions, then you can say that these are the potentially malignant disorder. You can definitely go for the diagnosis and help uh, our community or uh, the medical fraternity to detect the particular lesion early, right? I think, uh, uh, Dr. Shruti, I, uh, with that particular remark, I should uh, uh, conclude my lecture. Thank you, Dr. Nishit Soni. I hope uh, over I to you, Dr. <laughs> yeah, you are pretty much on time. <laughs> so, 
Dr. Prashant Shah, a, a quick concluding remark from your side before we uh, go to the next talk. Dr. Prashant, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. Yes, yes, uh, Dr. Prashant. Audible now? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nishit. Actually, uh, he was my classmate. So I'm very, very much happy to listen to uh, him again. Uh, okay, now concluding about the benign and malignant tumor early diagnosis and uh, the treatment planning. Yeah, really, all the lesions in the oral cavity uh, definitely clinically properly diagnosed in early stage and uh, need to be treated in very early stage. All the most probable lesions are uh, uh, in a good, uh, really, treatment condition. Uh, so I'm just, uh, you know, requesting all the doctors uh, who is associated with the this uh, treatment of oral cancer and all uh, for the early diagnosis and treatment planning to uh, all the colleagues uh, in the city and uh, all the nearby friends. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Uh, from all the participants, if you have any questions, you can please uh, put your question in the chat box and probably after all the four talks are over, we'll be happy to take those questions. Now, uh, without much delay, I move on to the next talk. And for that, I invite the chairperson and Dr. Vijay Prakash Madhur, who is the professor and head Division of Pedontics and Preventary Dentistry. Uh, he is a member in the Institute of Ethics, Subcommittee for Monitoring of Adverse Events and Clinical Trials, Center of Dental Education Research. He's been also collaborating with the WHO for the oral health promotion and is in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. So uh, he'll be chairing Dr. Riti Agarwal's talk. And it's my pleasure to have Dr. Riti Agarwal, who is a consistent consultant histopathologist at the Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket, New Delhi. So over to you, Dr. Riti Agarwal. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. You just have to full screen your slide. Yeah, just give me a second. Yeah, yeah, it will take some time. No problem. Uh, I think that's okay. Perfect. You can yeah. hear. Hi, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, I welcome you all for joining in today's meeting. And thank you, organizers. I'm uh, Dr. Riti. And the roadmap for my today's talk will be in two parts. In first part, I'll be discussing, you know, uh, shortly about these histopathological dilemmas and clues for diagnosis in oral lesions. And in the second part, I'll be discussing a little about HPV testing. So as already the epidemiology and the data has been discussed by Dr. Nishit, so I would uh, move directly to the dilemmas that we as per histopathologists face. So first dilemma, the most common is the pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia, in which we uh, usually face whether it's malignant or not. Uh, what is pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia? It's actually a very florid reactive epithelial proliferation seen in response to a variety of conditions, which includes infection, neoplasia, inflammation, and trauma. I guess the video is not clear. And when we see it on the biopsy, it is hyperkeratotic, irregular, and infiltrative like tongues of mature squamous epithelium. Uh, the slides are stuck. Hello. Dr. Riti, uh, you have actually not done the screen share. You have done the reading part. So if you just do the screen share, no? Uh, it's showing yeah. your screen Hello. sharing, Hello. sir. If you do the full slide, then it will not get stuck. You just undo that and then do the screen slide. Full screen. No, no, it's full screen only. It's full screen only, but I guess... Just, Maybe uh, the internet connection had some issues. Yeah. Like, no, no, no. Position, that is like, you know. So, okay, sorry for the interruption. So, uh, fluorid pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia, as I've already discussed, it's in seen in response to a variety of conditions. And what we see on microscopy is 
hyperkeratotic, irregular, and infiltrative trunks of mature squamous epithelium. And what is important here is uh, that there, is, there should not be any atypia, dysplasia, <laughs> dyskeratosis, and atypical mitotic figures. So this is a photograph where we can see this is the hyperplastic and hyperkeratotic stratified squamous epithelium. And this irregular, you know, these uh, sharp edges which are coming out into the dermis, this is what pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia looks like. And as compared to true dysplasia, this is a mild dysplasia, then we move on to, you know, full thickness dysplasia. In dysplasia, there will be nuclear atypia, loss of polarity, dyskeratosis, and a number of mitotic activity. So this is the photograph of the dyskeratosis, where you can see these schemoid cells showing dyskeratosis. And this is a photograph of the atypical mitotic triggers. You know, this is a tripolar mitosis. So when we see these features, these help us to reach to a diagnosis that that's, this is a true dysplastic lesion. And it's not just uh, mild atypia or, you know, a pseudo epithelomatous hyperplasia, which can be easily confused with the true malignancy. Uh, okay, so these were the atypical mitosis. So the second dilemma that is very commonly discussed is verrucous hyperplasia versus verrucous carcinoma. In verrucous hyperplasia, again, the epithelium is hyperplastic, hyperkeratotic, exophytic, and with the capillary fronds. Uh, this is a photograph. This is markedly, you can see, hyperkeratotic. And this is acanthotic as the thickness has increased. And these are the papillary forms, the church spires, what we call. And this bottom, at the bottom, these are the retics, which are broad. But still, they are not so pushing. When we see in verrucous carcinoma, they are quite pushy. But the important difference that is to, that helps us to differentiate between hyperplasia and carcinoma is the relationship of the epithelium with respect to the adjacent epithelium. Uh, this is the adjacent epithelium. Again here, these are the broad retics. With respect to the adjacent epithelium, they are still in line with the same. They are at the same level as that of the adjoining normal epithelium. And whereas in virucous carcinoma, it's a cauliflower-like surface. You can see how hyperkeratotic, acanthotic these have become. And the retics are so blunt, club-shaped, and very broad and pushing deep into the dermis. And definitely, they are you know, far more beyond uh, than the adjacent normal epithelium. And definitely, uh, one thing is more important is that there should not be any cytological atypia. If you start seeing cytological atypia, then you have to really look for the more tissue, because then it, this could be a very frank squamosal carcinoma also. So in the biopsy, there should not be any atypia. My cursor. So this is not dysplastic. There is no nuclear dyspolarity, no loss of polarity, no nuclear hyperchromasia. There is no uh, atypical mitotic activity. So if I, uh, if in this picture, I can tell you that this is a normal epithelium. As one moves to hyperplasia, definitely the hyperplasia has started. This is the exophytic fronds, but still more or less it is in line with the normal epithelium. All the fronds are at the same height and they're not so pushing and broad and bulbous. Whereas in verrucous carcinoma, these uh, papillary fronds are going far more beyond than the adjacent normal epithelium and deep down into the dermis also, they are very broad and pushy. These are the photographs. This is a normal epithelium. And this is the hyperkeratotic epithelium with these broad fronts. And they are far much more deeper into the tissue, into the dermis, as compared to the just a normal epithelium. So this is the main point that really helps us to know about verrucous hyperplasia and carcinoma. That is why we, it's very important in these lesions that the adjacent normal epithelium, the junction has to be there in the biopsy. Then it really helps you to identify. Otherwise, sometimes, you know, as a pathologist, we report it as a scrum proliferative lesion. Or if suppose the biopsy has been just taken from the superficial top and the biopsy is flat, then we really can't make out anything because neither can we see the depth nor we can see the adjacent epithelium. And when the lesion is quite, you know, exuberant, then these are the epithelial fronts where um, it's, you know, forming a amalgamate and all the sections are like this. These are, you know, just the pictures showing you the varicose carcinoma. Know a little about HPV testing. I won't go into the details much. As we all know that oropharyngeal carcinoma is about 40 to 60 percent and they're linked to HPV. And the most common site and the site for the predilection are tonsils and base of the tongue as they are, you know, uh, lymphoid rich sites. And the two types of HPV infections, low risk and high risk. Low risk is 6 and 11 and high risk is 16 and 18. 
and HPV-16 is the main genotype that is responsible for head and neck cancers. And when we come to HPV-positive cancers, the sites of prediction being tonsil and the base of the tongue, since they are uh, very easy for the lymphoid access, so that is why these patients presented in advanced end stage, nodal metastasis is usually seen. And uh, when we come to the genetics, the P16 mutation happens in HPV positive, which we are uh, able to assess through P16 IHC. That is the first surrogate marker that we like to put because P16 is positive for HPV positive. Whereas in HPV negative, P53 is there. It's a mutated and wild type. In wild type, it is a heterogeneous positivity seen, which is weak or uh, patchy heterogeneous. And when we call P53 mutated, it can be uh, mutated in two forms, which we see on IHC in our IHC slides. Either it should be diffusely positive, homogeneous positive, or it can be dead negative. So what is important is that dead negative should not be ignored. When it is completely negative, then also it is mutated. So that is why we prefer to write P53 wild type and mutated type rather than positive and negative, because negative in dead negative also is mutated. And for the testing, the P16 is the primarily surrogate marker that we do for by IC. The other um, tests that can be done are PCR-based, DNA-ish, and latest is NGS, which helps us to characterize or identify the complete molecular structure. But I think more needs to be done in NGS because uh, once we identify the entire profile only, then I guess uh, the targeted therapies and vaccines can be made out. So this is a PCR, RT-PCR can be there. And PCR-based assays actually have lower specificity. And P16 has higher sensitivity. That is why the first marker that we try to put is P16. And DNA-ish is also there. It, since it, it uh, is helpful to detect integrated viral DNA, it is a higher specificity and a lower sensitivity. So this is one of the algorithm that I've put that HPV 6 markers, P16 is the first marker. And when, as we move downwards towards NGS, we are able to actually target the E6, E7, messenger RNAs, the micro RNAs and all the structures. So this is just uh, to conclude, this is a slide where the P16 IHC, when it is positive, it looks like this. And HPV DNA, these are the, you know, blue, purplish uh, dots. And in NGS, this E6, E7, messenger RNA, so it just looks uh, so, uh, more like I'd see. So uh, to conclude my talk, I would like to mention one more thing that uh, whenever these histological dilemmas and all these are considered, the important thing is to have a proper clinical pathological correlation. In these biopsies, even when we are not able to see the junction, if we call up our clinicians and we ask, uh, what is the site? What is the size of the lesion? And they are uh, really, you know, uh, as I can see, Dr. Rohit Neyasar is there, Dr. Akshat is there. But all these clinicians of ours who are of always great help, they actually tell us what was the size of the lesion, where the institutional biopsy has been done, what, are, what were their limitations. So that also gives us a clue that, yes, they, have, they are on the right place. We need to work more on that. So what we do is, uh, in the difficult cases, we try to put cytokeratin also to see the single cell infiltration. That probably we are missing onto something. We go for deep cuts. We reorient the biopsy. Sometimes we melt our block. We reorient it, re-embed it, and go for deeper cuts so as to have a better picture. So, and uh, that's all, I guess. Uh, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you for the... Thank, you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Riti. Uh, in fact, you are the one who gives us the green signal. So the role of the clinicians really actually then start. So thank you for that lucid talk. We now move on to the next talk. So may I invite Dr. Rohit Nair to be the moderator for this session. Thank uh, all the organizers. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. I, I thank Bowen and the ICANN care team for uh, giving me this opportunity to interact with uh, all of you. Uh, my job is quite simple, but it is a difficult one to introduce Dr. Gauri. She's been the lead surgeon from Tata Memorial Hospital. She's a professor and surgeon, and is in, she's in the field for last almost more than 20 years. Uh, she'll be discussing uh, regarding the changes in the AJCC8 tradition. So lots have happened, particularly in head and neck cancers, as far as staging of oral cancers is concerned. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Gauri to take over and start her proceedings without uh, wasting much time? Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone, and um, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, Dr. De Cruz, and uh, the, uh, Vikram, and the team from I Can Care for uh, inviting me for this talk. Um, uh, my brief is on talking of staging and interpreting the newer aspects in AJCZ eighth edition, its clinical implications. Um, I have uh, fifteen minutes, so I must say that I have taken a small liberty here. Uh, seeing that this is uh, basically an oral cancer conclave, I'm going to be uh, basically talking on the changes in the eighth edition and the implications in oral cavity cancers only. Uh, I hope that should be okay. Um, I'm going to start by saying that uh, staging uh, without doubt is um, the bedrock. It is what really decides uh, everything that we do in all points of treatment in every cancer. Now, the AJCC brought out the 8th edition. Uh, it published it in 2017. The 7th edition was earlier in 2010. And um, it, as the AJCC always does, it's very diligent when it brings out a new edition, changes in the TNM staging. It had 18 expert panels, 7 cores, 420 contributors from 181 institutions, 22 countries, 6 continents. So everyone was represented in this and only then was a change made in the TNM staging. They tried to bring in other factors like comorbidities, performance station, performance status, nutrition, depression, everything into their TNM staging. And actually their vision uh, this time in the eighth edition was to not just have TNM, but to have prognostic factors, clinical trial stratifications, risk assessment models, and change it from a population-based TNM staging to a more personalized TNM staging. So the TNM classification, the eighth edition was published in 2017. Its uh, implementation was started from 2018. And um, uh, really, the, um, the, the, there were a lot of changes in head and neck. A large bit of it was from the HPV-associated cancer of the oropharynx, which was staged differently than the oropharyngeal cancers. Really, this has not made too much of a difference to us because um, not too many of our patients are HPV positive. The N categories were changed in the nasopharyngeal cancers. There were certain changes in the structuring of the chapters of skin cancers, salivary, mucosal malignancies of the upper aerodigestive tract. But the really interesting change uh, that they brought about was in the T and N staging of oral cavity cancers, something of great interest to us because large part of our practice made majority of our patients and a very common cancer in India is the oral cavity cancer. So just to revise a little bit about what was the T staging in the seventh edition. In the seventh edition, the T staging revolved around T size to four more than four centimeters. It looked at involvement of adjacent structures, bone, skin, masticator space, etc. And in tongue cancers, it had some certain um, terminologies like ankyloglossia, extrinsic muscles involvement of the tongue. Now, these kind of factors, factors like ankyloglossia were very subjective. I mean, some people thought patient had ankyloglossia, some thought didn't have. Extrinsic muscle involvement was difficult to define, not specific. People never knew how to define extrinsic muscle involvement. And this used to cause a lot of problem to us in T-staging. Now, everybody realized this ankyloglossia, extrinsic muscle involvement, especially in tongue cancer, was basically a surrogate for depth of invasion. What it was showing was that depth of invasion, when it was more, you had extrinsic muscle involvement, you had ankyloglossia. And what people realized was that depth of invasion was probably a more objective way to try and define these terms rather than extrinsic muscle involvement or, or ankyloglossia. Now, over the last decade, what also happened was uh, the differences between depth of invasion and thickness were better defined. People understood what was the difference. And a lot of literature came in showing depth of invasion as a very, very important prognostic factor, both for neural metastasis and disease outcomes. So people started realizing that depth of invasion seems to be a very important factor for a numerous reasons. Now, adding to that, came this study, which was the i study, which looked at depth of invasion as an indication for post-operative radiotherapy. This was what the study was published for. We were a part of this study also. It was a retrospective analysis of around 1,500 patients, less than four centimeter per primomoral squamous cancers. 
Now, what they found in this study was that for every five millimeter increase in the depth of invasion, there was a significant increase in the disease specific mortality. This is when they realized, and we always knew that depth of invasion was a poor prognostic factor, but it was always related more with nodal metastasis. But if they found that disease specific mortality was also affected. And what they did then was they tried to incorporate depth of invasion in the T-staging. And then this T-staging with the depth of invasion was validated in an institutional data set, which was the MSKCC Princess Margaret data set. And they found there was good hazard discrimination when you included depth of invasion in the T-staging. And then the depth of invasion came as one of the important factors in the eighth edition. So if you looked at the T category for oral cavity, there is no T0. The T0 is eliminated. And for every 5 millimeter increase, there is an increase in the depth of it. There is an increase in the T stage. You will also see that you do not have the ankyloglossia, the extrinsic muscles of invasion, extrinsic muscles of uh, tongue involvement. All of that has been removed from the T4, which was very subjective and very difficult to determine. Now, when this depth of invasion came in 2018 as a part of the TNM staging, all of us were a little troubled. We all decided, we all were wondering, how do you assess this depth of invasion preoperatively? And uh, we all um, thought that um, it's in the TNM staging, it's in the clinical TNM staging. So you have to do it before we go ahead for surgery. How do we do it? The two obvious methods that we had with us was clinical examination and radiology. And all of us started putting our fingers into patients' mouths and trying to pinch tumors, palpating tumors, trying to figure out whether we can make out depth of invasion. But we have all realized in the last uh, couple of years, three years, that really uh, trying to find out depth of invasion clinically is not very easy. It's not validated. It's really difficult to evaluate for gingivobuccal cancers, alveolar cancers, heart palate cancers, and for cancers that are in the posterior part of the oral cavity. Trismus often prevents accurate examination. And this is one of the important implications of depth of invasion in the clinical TNM staging. So let's look at what happened with radiology. So the three modalities that were described for depth of assessing depth of in invasion preoperatively was ultrasound, CT scan, and MRI. Uh, quite a few research articles trying to look at these three modalities. Uh, I'm not going through each of these research articles for want of time. I'm just going to give you a summary of radiological assessment for depth of invasion. Now, most literature looks at tumor thickness and not depth of invasion. And this is because depth of invasion actually is a pathological term. It's not a radiological term at all. So they will still report tumor thickness or whatever they think is depth of invasion. Most of the series looking at radiological preoperative assessment is small and most is in tongue cancers. Not many, not much of literature available for buccal cancers and gingivobuccal tumors. All three modalities, depending on which paper you read, have similar accu accuracy. The, the ultrasound seems to have a little lower accuracy compared to MRI. Some say CT scan is better. But in the whole picture, if you look at the whole picture on radiological assessment, depth of invasion probably best measured in tongue cancers with the use of an MRI. So if you look at radiological assessment, um, you will have to do it with either a CT scan or an MRI. Uh, not very well validated, but that's the best option that you have available because clinical examination is pretty difficult for making out depth of invasion. Now to add to this, this is an interesting paper which looked at uh, do radiologists report the TNM staging in radiology reports for head and neck cancers? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this was actually conducted in 2016, and this was before this depth of invasion came. They looked at 782 respondents from the United States. Now, even before depth of invasion complicated this, and even in the United States, only 25% of radiologists actually reported the TNM staging in the radiology reports. And many of the critiques of the new TNM staging said that adding depth of invasion is going to further worsen this and radiologists are going to rarely report the TNM staging now. And this is something that practically we also see. 
we do get radiologists reporting depth of invasion in tongue cancers, but in any other cancers, it's something that we don't report. Now, why we are talking so much about preoperative depth of invasion, the one question that I always ask myself is, what is really the need of preoperative depth of invasion? Do I really need to know this preoperative depth of invasion? Of course, it's there in the CT and I'm staging, but what is the need? Do I check it out in every patient? Now, what we know is depth of invasion predicts nodal metastasis. But in my book, elective neck dissection is now the standard of care for both early and advanced oral cancers. So I really don't need a predictor of nodal metastasis. So the role of preoperative depth of invasion, yes, you want to know the CTNM staging, but besides that, it's probably to just prognosticate. It helps counsel patients for possible adjuvant therapy. So if you have a depth of invasion that's more than a centimeter preoperatively, you know that this probably is going to be a stage three tumor and this patient will probably require adjuvant therapy. This patient may have higher nodal metastasis, poorer outcomes. Now the place where the depth of invasion really has a high implication is the pathological TNM. Now it is here that thicker tumors get upstaged to T2 and T3. And when thicker tumors get upstaged, irrespective of the T size, these patients, more patients will start receiving adjuvant radiotherapy. So depth of invasion really is very important and the TNM staging makes a big difference in the pathological TNM staging. Now, uh, besides depth of invasion, I just want to bring your attention to one more issue in the pathological TNM staging, and that is that superficial erosion of the bone has been removed from the TNM staging, and actually, there is no T stage for superficial bone erosion. Now, this sometimes does become a problem in the pathological T stage. Uh, this is out of experience when you have a patient that comes to you with a histopathology report at the end of your surgery who has a smallish tumor but does have superficial erosion, does not fit into a T3 or previously it used to be a T3 tumor, now it does not fit. There is no prognostic significance given in the pathological TNM staging for superficial bone erosion. Whether it has prognostic, in the, in a, a prognostic significance or no, we do not know. Uh, but this is one thing that does cause a problem for us sometimes when our patients come to us with superficial bone erosion in their pathology report and the patient still becomes a T1 tumor or a T2 tumor and we don't know whether we need to give this patient's adjuvant radiotherapy or not. So depth of invasion, important in the pathological TNM staging. So uh, since the depth of invasion has been incorporated in the TNM staging, a lot of validation of this depth of invasion and the AJCC 8th edition has happened. Numerous studies have come, 10, 15 studies have come looking at whether this depth of invasion, and that's how it should be. Literature should always check when you have a new AJCC uh, uh, edition that's coming. When you have so many editions, so many literature, what I like to do is look at a publication that comes from your own country. This is a wonderful publication that came from Deepak and from the Amrita group. This looked at validation of the eighth edition of the AJCC staging system in early T1, T2 oral squamous cancers. Now, they looked at 441 T1, T2 tumors in a 10-year period. They reclassified these T1, T2 tumors. These were previously classified as T1, T2 in the seventh edition. They reclassified as per the eighth edition. Now, when you reclassify, it's the same group of tumors. What happened was 50% of these tumors were upstaged. What happened is you got a new stage of these 441 tumors. 141 tumors went on to T3. So basically, this is the same group of patients, but now they have got upstaged to 141. And I would like to then introduce you all to a concept concept which is called stage migration. Now, this is one of the very, very important implications of a new addition of a TNM staging. What happens is your patients all go and do a, what is called a stage migration when you reevaluate these patients. Now, what this means is you have to look at the survival differences because of stage migration. If you look at the seventh edition in this particular same uh, paper, T1 tumors had a five-year overall survival of 78%. T2 tumors had a five-year overall survival of 61%. Now, in the same patients, just by adding, uh, by reclassifying them on the eighth edition, 
The five-year overall survival improved to 87% for T1 tumors. It improved to 61% for T2 tumors because a large percentage of patients moved to T3 and their survival became 58%. Now, this is called stage migration. And in the new further few years, we are going to have new survival statistics for stage one to four oral cancers and stage migration is going to be an issue. And this is an important implication of the TNM staging. So to summarize depth of invasion in the eighth edition, for every five millimeter increase in depth of invasion, it upstages the T stage. You have a stage migration of T1 to T2 and from T2 to T3. You have better survivals now for T1, T2 tumors. The preoperative estimation of depth of invasion, however, still remains a challenge. Clinical examination is very difficult, not validated. You have to use radiology along with clinical examination that can be between, with a CT scan or an MRI. The pathological TNM is actually where depth of invasion is an important factor to decide a juvenile treatment. And now in the last three years, the new T staging has been validated with disease outcome in multiple studies. So it seems like a robust um, uh, TNM staging. We come to the second part of the change that happened in the TNN staging, and that was the extra nodal extension, which is ENE. Uh, lymph node metastasis, as we know, is an important predictor of disease outcomes. Presence of ENE decreases uh, your survival. So we all know it's an important factor uh, predicting survival. What the eighth edition did was it just added this ENE to make the staging system more robust. They realized that this is an important predictor, an important prognosticator. It should not be left out from the staging system. And as you can see, the N3 got split up into an N3A and N3B. The N3A is a, a, a node that's more than six centimeters without ENE. And an N3B is um, a node that's more than six centimeters with extra nodal extension. And you have both clinical and pathological. Now, the evidence for this also came originally from uh, data from the NCDB database, which was again validated on the same institutional data from the MSKCC Princess Margaret group. They again found good hazard discrimination in most of the stages, N stages, not all of the stages. And then it came into the eighth edition. They also defined clinical ENE as presence of skin involvement of soft tissue invasion with deep fixation, tethering to underlying muscles or adjacent structures, or clinical signs of nerve involvement as clinical extra nodal extension. This is a little more simpler than clinical depth of invasion. It is easier for us to identify, though not still um, uh, validated as to how many of these are actually extra nodal extension or no. Pathological ENE, they further classified into minor or major. Uh, this is not in the TNM staging. This is only for data collection. Minor as less than two millimeters, major as more than two millimeters. If you look at the implications of ENE, preoperatively, uh, basically, again, to prognosticate and probably help surgeon plan surgery if you know you have ENE. Postoperatively, it's mandatory to document ENE in the pathology report. And this is basically for addition of adjuvant chemoradiation for patients with extra nodal extension. So extra nodal extension didn't really cause too much of a flurry for us. We were always reporting extra nodal extension even before TNM came. And that was because it had an implication on adjuvant chemoradiation, but it's now into the uh, TNM staging. So it becomes mandatory to now report it. Now, um, it seems that the TNM staging is doing well and is being well validated, but you always have to look at a contrarian view. Some articles now coming looking at the prognostic performance of the TNM 8 staging, which don't say that, which say that it's not really very good. This is a retrospective validation of 297 patients just published December 2020, which looked at the entire stage. This is not just the T stage or the depth of invasion. It compared the 7th and 8th edition. They looked at it with regard to survival. And as you can see, there is not too much of a difference between the 7th edition and the 8th edition. They said that the overall, the 8th edition had better discrimination than the 7th, but it was unable to discriminate between stage 3 and 4A and stage 1 and 2. And there are few other articles that have also said that the 8th edition is not absolutely perfect. It's difficult to get um, a TNM staging that's perfect because there are so many other factors besides T, N, and M that determine survival. They also concluded that the validation of the eighth edition in a larger data set is still required. And I think that's work in progress and uh, we have to see how they do. But as of today, uh, 
depth of invasion and ENE are the main changes in oral cavity cancers in the eighth edition. The CTNM, clinical TNM, uh, is a clinical radio, clinical radiological. It's not just a clinical, it's not just based on clinical examination. The implications basically are largely on prognosis. Two is that depth of invasion causes a lot of stage migration, causes a lot of upstaging of disease, and a larger percentage of our patients because of this stage migration are going to have increased use of adjuvant treatment and change of adjuvant treatment. Thank you very much. Any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Thank you, Dr. Puja, Dr. Gauri. Uh, there are a few questions. So, Dr. Rohit, we will take the question after the all four talks are over, but I would request you to give a concluding remark before I go to the last talk of the today's conclave. So, staging has, uh, is critically, critically more important as far as uh, prognosis of the patient is concerned. And, uh, hello, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, but I think there is some disturbance from your side. Yeah, now it's clear. You can go ahead. Hello. Uh, am I? I think my audio is gone. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gauri, for the nice presentation. You have elaborated a lot about the changes in the TNM staging. Uh, uh, how is it going to affect our clinical practice? Is time is going to tell us, but definitely with addition of chemo radiation and migration of the stage from stage two to stage three with the increased depth of invasion has made a difference as far as treatment decisions are concerned. Secondly, about the HPV positivity, because of, uh, we do have two separate sets, HPV positive and HPV negative, where more of uh, the surgeons are doing laser surgeries and the robotic surgeries are going on for case of time and consonant tumors particularly for HPV positive tumors, where you have an excellent prognosis, where you can avoid radiation in these patients from other regions. So I thank you and uh, we'll be taking questions in the end. So I'll forward to Dr. Uh, Dr. Nandwani. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we now move on to the last talk of the today's conclave and after that we'll be having a very interesting panel discussion but the last talk for that talk i would invite uh, dr bhavna dave she's a very dynamic lady she is at present uh, she's uh, completed a post graduation from nair hospital So she completed her post graduation from Nair Hospital Dental College, Mumbai in 1988. And currently she is the Dean at KM Shah Dental College and Hospital, Barodra, Gujarat. She is Professor and Head in the Department of Pediatric and Preventive Dentistry at the KMS DSCH and also a PhD guide. She has various uh, publications to her credit, has co-authored around six textbooks and has about 20 years of teaching experience for undergo undergraduates and the postgraduates along with the immense clinical experience gained over the years. For the talk, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Hitesh Devan. He is a consultant oral maxillofacial surgeon and he did his uh, DNB in 2003. He has been a professor and PG guide at the Department of uh, OMFS at the Nadiyat Gujarat. And his key areas of interest are trauma, TMJ surgery, implants, uh, benign pathology, SMF, etc. So without wasting much time, over to you, Dr. Hitesh Devan. And after this last talk, we'll be now taking the questions also. But first, uh, Dr. Hitesh Devan, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Is my audio clear? Yes, audible. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Somesh, uh, to allow me for presentation. And I'm very happy to be in this August company. Now, uh, SMF, I am, as a maxillofacial surgeon, per se, don't, eat, don't treat uh, oral cancers. I refer them to the oncosurgeons. But I have a huge number of patients uh, with SMF coming at different stages. As you all know that Gujarat, India is the cancer capital of the world. And Gujarat is the cancer capital of India. So, in Gujarat, we say that... Uh, 
jokingly that the milk shops open little late but the pan shops open early in the morning so the extent of uh, tobacco and its <clears throat> adjuvants like uh, betel nut is so prevalent that patients uh, they come to us with basic problems of inability to eat uh, burning uh, burning sensation and uh, difficulty to eat spicy food and the most uh, and when we counsel them to stop the habit they uh, they more and they come for a follow up their most concerned part is that their mouth was opening reasonably well they when they were chewing tobacco and once they have stopped chewing tobacco or supari then their mouth opening has reduced because that is uh, implemented to the fact that now the musculature is not into continuous use so putting that fear of malignancy into them and counseling them and treating the submucous fibrosis is one of our mainstays of practice so looking at this picture when we when a patient like this comes to us he is a living nightmare for us what exactly you do with such a patient right we can't examine him we don't we don't know whether there is any a lesion underlying inside uh, whether to counsel them for surgery even these patients they push the tobacco and betel nut from the sides of the mouth with a pencil or with any other instrument also to get that kick because of that of the habit and they are not able to leave the habit so uh, and the basic problem as i told you they come with burning sensation and inability to eat and treatments have been very varying in the past uh, regarding the medical line of management and the surgical line of management briefly uh, as you all know regarding submucous fibrosis it is uh, classically defined by pinberg and sirsat where it is juxta epithelial inflammatory reactions and stiffness of the oral mucosa these are the clinical presentations where we see fibrous bands all over the oral cavity anteroperitoneal fossas soft palate buccal mucosa even in the angle of the mouth and in the floor of the mouth also <clears throat> the wonderful article which shows the basic tra uh, transformation of the supple oral mucosa into a fibrous mucosa where the four schools of theory are there from the alkaloids to the flavonoids to copper theory and the constant chewing everything as you all know that the collagen uh, the basic type of collagen in the oral mucosa is type 3 and slowly it is converted into a type 1 Uh, type of collagen and uh, because of increased muscular over contracture and uh, increased level of soluble copper and saliva because of the arecanut and the alkaloids and this is a flow chart which gives us the justification how the fibrosis develops and increases uh, slowly and slowly now we must all be very clear uh, what is the difference between uh, the basic submucous fibrosis and radiation fibrosis now when patients come to us with post radiation and if they have a pre existing uh, smf then the amount of amount of fibrosis is much much more as compared to patients with conventional submucous fibrosis and it involves the joints also and there is too many adhesions in the temporomandibular joint and we need to not only go for intraoral fibrotomy but sometimes we need to address the joint as well to release the fibrosis and post radiations of course we are bound by the chances of radiation necrosis so we normally don't advocate too much of uh, surgical intervention unless we find a potentially malignant lesion developing again or a dental injury causing trauma to the underlying flap uh, clinical presentation is fine but the chances of malignant transformation in advanced submucous fibrosis is around 70 to 30% and uh, molecular markers and loss of heterozygosity it is there but i will not go into too much of theory i'll just highlight couple of cases and what difficulties technical difficulties we face when we are treating the cases of submucous fibrosis uh very pioneering classification given by our peers kanna uh, and andrade group 1 group 2 where the lesion is uh, advancing mouth opening is reducing to 26 to 35 group 3 15 to 25 mm and group 4 is a advanced changes and histologically there are uh, hyaluronic wood chip collagens extensive fibrosis uh, fibrosis obliterated blood vessels 
and uh, eliminated melanocytes and loss of epithelial reticles. But on top of that, when there is chronic or constant uh, frictional irritation because of the dentition, there is a time where the malignant changes they start. And unfortunately, it is very difficult to see because of the profound reasons. The ther therapy of submucous fibrosis has been varied. We are bombarded by medical reps who come with photographs saying that you prescribe our medicines, you will get wonderful results for oral therapy, beta carotene, steroids, interferons. All sorts of things are hammered on us. But honestly, uh, this is not a treatable disease uh, medically. Only if you are very, very clear in counseling them at a very early stage, then these patients do respond. But the changes of the oral mucosa sometimes, and more often than not, are permanent and the fibrosis normally doesn't resolve. Surgically, we have been trying out a lot of things in the past, like just putting, just doing a fibrotomy, putting a collagen membrane. But our mainstay of therapy in our practice ranges from the buccal fat pad, graft, and the nasolabial flaps. These are the two uh, sorts of therapy what we are doing. I am not trained in microvascular uh, anastomosis or any other advanced procedures, but I will be just sharing some uh, viewpoints regarding the buccal fat pad and the uh, nasolabial flaps in my talk. Now, as I told you, the chances of regression of the submucous fibrosis is not there. And uh, treatment is, of course, uh, final treatment is your surgical part. But we have to identify these candidates, right? Other than that, what happens in our scenario? That our routine practices, like any dental procedures, are practically impossible. And if you have patients has a loose processes in the mouth, the chances of developing malignancies because of the traumatic injury is much higher. You cannot even retract the tissues or any vocal retraction to see what is going on. And any treatment required in the posterior teeth is practically not possible. Simple extractions of the teeth, they become so and so difficult. Bleeding is profuse and uh, suturing practically is not possible in these cases. You, more often than not, you will find a malignant lesion or a doubtful lesion in the RMT regions where the third molars are erupting. Those are the areas which have the most potential for developing the uh, malignancies. <clears throat> so, when do you ultimately treat a patient for submucous fibrosis for the surgical intervention? My thought process is very, very clear. First of all, the patient should have mouth opening less than 15-20 millimeters. If he is able to chew normally more than 20 millimeters, we discourage the patient to go for surgical intervention because it induces more amount of uh, fibrosis. Secondly, the, the timing of surgery means patient should have left the habit at least six months back before we enter into the surgical therapy. Why is that important? Suppose patient uh, says, okay, now I will stop the habit. You just do the surgery. The problem is that the first of all, his body is used to the tobacco, his body is used to the arachnid, and we are stopping that. On top of that, we are adding the trauma of surgery. And this not only creates a very vicious cycle that ultimately patients end up into a psychological problem and they restart the habit again. So patients who are really motivated to stop the habit at least six months prior to the release of submucous fibrosis, these are the real candidates who should be planned for surgery. And of course, who will agree for a very vigorous follow-up and very stringent post-operative physiotherapy. So finding a right candidate for surgery is a very, very challenging task, motivating them. Patients do get motivated because of the pressure of their, uh, of their family members, but then ultimately they have to be the people who will have to undergo the post-op physiotherapy. Again, during anesthesia also, you cannot do any sort of uh, awake intubation. You have to have access to uh, fiber optic intubation. Even for doing simple procedures, or doing, doing, removing third molars, or we have to have a person competent enough who will give us the fiber optic intubation. So any extraction procedures, as I told you, it becomes very, very difficult. 
and we normally tell the patients to get your third molars out uh, and uh, at least the chances of the development of lesions in the rmt region becomes uh, less because that is the area where your chances of uh, malignancy is highest when we do the surgical release of uh, the uh, smf one uh, debatable aspect is the whether to remove the coronoid process or just to cut and let it go honestly we as aggressive surgeons initially we believe that removing the coronoid is a big achievement but honestly it induces much more amount of trauma and cutting at cutting the coronoid and just letting it go that is the coronoidotomy is less traumatic and it effectively gives the same type of results right these are the two commonest flaps what we are uh, doing it our practices one is the nasolabial and is the buccal fat pad for release of the submucous fibrosis now if when we compare these two uh, there are two to three uh, areas of concern one very important concern area is a young patient who does not want any scar on the face second uh, uh, criteria for inclusion of these patients is whether how much amount of buccal mucosa is fibrous you know sometimes only the retromolar area is fibrous the buccal mucosa is free so these are not candidates where you require a interpositional graft right only the removal of that third molars and doing the coronoid will take care of releasing the fibrosis patients who are of the older age group and have got excess skin in the nasolabial fold are actually the right candidates but honestly the buccal fat pad although it is uh, easier to harvest and it is does not offer a second side morbidity the problem with that is that uh, it gets fibrosed over a period of time as it comprises of a similar tissue whereas the skin of the face uh, this nasolabial area it uh, does not get fibrosed and offers a long term solution for you know treating the submucous fibrosis the scars eventually they fade out and patients uh, they can definitely go for a good amount of physiotherapy in the later stages a lot of uh, articles have been highlighted in the uh, literature some giving advantages to the nasolabial some giving advantage to the buccal fat pad but uh, buccal fat pad over a period of time what we have seen in many many years they do have a tendency to get fibrosis and uh, nasolabial offers a much uh, longer and a more predictable outcome they can the nasolabial also sometimes does not have it has its fair share of mishaps also like flap necrosis uh, and patients always complain of intraoral hair growth which is many times cumbersome facial scars of course nobody wants on the face but then uh, it fades out over a period of time the persistent uh, orocutaneous fistula can be taken care in the second surgical intervention <clears throat> sometimes even you have the widening of the oral commission now important is that if you injure this angle of the mouth during your fibrosis release the patient uh, this area normally is not reconstructed uh, because the flap of the nasolabial flap does not extend exactly at the angle of the mouth and this raw area is actually quite painful to the patient and patient gets demotivated to do the post operative physiotherapy and once that demotivation sets in the fibrosis again sets in so making we have to be very careful not to injure the angle of the mouth during the surgical release another overzealous uh, surgery done by somebody else you can clearly see that if you injure the angle of the mouth you can lead to adhesions uh, over that area and which may warrant another uh, type of surgery and release but again these patients who have a tendency to develop hypertrophic scar they can easily go into the refibrosis under oral hair growth is one uh, issue which uh, patients do complain of but honestly Uh, over a long period of time, two to three years, they slowly it atrophies. And initial first four to six months, we can even go for uh, plucking it out with the mosquito forceps or a laser therapy is done after six to eight months. At least once we are sure that the uh, flap has taken up completely. Now, 
most important is your post operative physiotherapy and when we take these patients for uh, the surgery we have to really drill the patients for because initially they say yes yes we will do the physiotherapy we will do lot of exercises but once uh, the pain part starts in the post operative phase they lose the motivation right so that counseling of the patients prior to surgery is of extreme importance after everything is done and every part is taken care of uh, patients always want some prosthetic rehabilitation or patients have loose teeth or they don't have teeth in the oral cavity and this actually is very detrimental to the patient who want to do a proper physiotherapy because these patients they require good sound teeth on which their physiotherapy can be done later on for the putting of the mouth props or using the histers drop or, or the fermentation part there if the teeth are not there or if the dentition is very poor the patients again lose the motivation for uh, doing the physiotherapy and eventually reach to refibrosis important very important part is during surgery that all the dental cusps uh, which can cause potential uh, uh, frictional keratosis to the buccal mucosa they should either be rounded off or at least uh, if the third molars are there they should be removed during the surgery no cases we would like to deal with where we leave the third molars in situ because again and again this is going to come back and the fibrosis is going to increase over a period of time couple of cases which have been treated this was one by uh, done by us and highly motivated guy this was done with a buccal fat pad and a good amount of mouth opening was achieved and females normally you can see the injury to the angle of the mouth here but she was quite motivated to get into the physiotherapy mode and obviously being a female should not want any scar on the face <clears throat> A female lady as who has excess skin over and loose uh, nasolabial area. These are good candidates to for your nasolabial flaps, and they offer uh, good laxity of that area, so you can easily insert the nasolabial flaps. <clears throat> one the same case which I showed before. This is a one-year follow-up of the same patient, and uh, predictably, uh, these cases of nasolabial flap. they offer a much better solution as compared to your other techniques and uh, that's all i just wanted to compare couple of uh, this thing between the two uh, techniques and uh, eventually after many years of uh, practice we do have come up to the fact that uh, first of all identification of the patient with a good candidate for surgery secondly motivating them for your post op physiotherapy and the third one is having a very long term follow up for these patients thank you very much for your kind attention thank you dr devan and we now move on to the concluding remarks from dr bhavna dave ma'am hello am i audible yes you are uh, uh, first of all let me congratulate i can care a team it was a wonderful uh, initiative to have this kind of programs and uh, you know to have this kind of program is going to really help us out and as dr divan has rightly said that uh, gujarat being the capital of uh, oral uh, uh, pre malignant and malignant lesions i would uh, definitely congratulate gujarat university too uh, dr divan has explained everything so simply and very nicely and i must say here that being a pediatric dentist uh, we have come across few patients who were you know above 9 years 9 to 13 years they have also shown us certain uh, you know uh, areas where we can see those uh, rural areas where we have seen the cases of uh, uh, submucous fibrosis so what he is telling is absolutely correct and we need to you know curb this uh, uh, what you can say this kind of uh, situation in gujarat uh, thank you dr divan and thank you the team thank you ma'am thank you so we now invite the questions and i would start first with dr divan only uh, yes, there's a question from aman raj uh, how can we clinically distinguish the radiation and the osmf and Does the treatment remain the same? 
good question madam normally history of radiation is something what the patient is going to tell us right whether he has undergone radiation therapy or not now when we are dealing with patients want a treatment of christmas post radiation we tell the patient that you have to be oncologically free for at least 3 to 5 years before we attempt surgical release of uh, these uh, this fibrosis we do not under advise the patients to undergo a surgical release of post radiation fibrosis at least for 3 to 4 years and differentiation clinically is that the fibrosis in radiation is much more severe and uh, entire oral cavity and sometimes if you see the ct is an mri of the joints also then the joints also there is a lot of adhesion within the temporal and the joints and we need to address those even externally and uh, but very 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 clear aspect is that i don't advise the patients to go for surgical release at least they are 100% oncological uh thank you my next question is to dr gauri what is the actual tumor size in stage 3 cancers are you there dr gauri I think our audio is off. Yes. Okay, they were not allowing me to unmute. Now I'm unmuted. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice question. So uh, the T size is only mentioned as above four centimeters. Anything above four centimeters, as far as T size is concerned, still remains as T three, and it stays as stage three. Um, if you are saying what is the upper limit of uh, uh, T size, nobody is given the upper limit of T size. what happens is if you have larger tumors if you have a 4 cm 5 cm generally starts involving surrounding structures like bone skin and it becomes a t4 tumor and that's why they've not given an upper limit uh, to a t3 tumor so anything that's more than 4 cm just there is no upper limit given to a t3 tumor ma'am before you are muted again i will first ask you only your relevant questions so uh, does the new tnm impacts the surgical plan or only the joint plan in the prognostication so um i would say it doesn't impact the surgical plan a lot uh, except if you are because the depth of invasion and the nodal extent both are something that is more pathological um if you have thicker tumors you are going to have uh, you're not going to look at the thicker tumors in millimeters uh preoperatively yes you're going to look at the thickness of your tumor but you're going to look more at what structures it involves like let's say if you have a tongue tumor yes you want to know how thick a tumor is to plan your surgical excision to plan your reconstruction but really you don't want to look at it in millimeters you don't want to look at 3 mm 5 mm 10 mm you just want to see what structures it involves uh, so really surgical planning pre operatively not so important more important is for the adjuvant treatment uh, and for prognostication that the new tnm system is uh, in place yeah the depth of infiltration is been incorporated in all sites of cancers you see esophagus you take colon you take stomach the depth of infiltration is very except for oral cancers where the depth was not there people didn't know how to measure the depth and which structures to look into when depth is concerned now they have come out with the dimensions of 5 mm and 5 to 10 and more than 10 so that's how they are going to prognosticate patients as far as treatment decisions are concerned because we already know that these are the tumors we are going for a selective neck dissection already in these patients so if upfront neck dissection is in plan depth of infiltration doesn't hold much as far as treatment plan is concerned pre operatively yes, so i said the same thing that it really doesn't matter with the treatment planning so much it's more of a prognostication and more for the adjuvant treatment i agree with what you said So next question again to you ma'am which are those subset of opmd which are you would likely to observe and which you would likely to resect uh with regard to oral premalignant lesions uh, you have the high risk ones and the low risk ones and i think that's been quite well defined uh so i for the high risk ones i would definitely like to operate Uh, even in the low risk ones uh, i would definitely like to try i would definitely do a biopsy for most of the low risk ones also 
with regard to high risk one the ones that i will definitely operate are patients which have erythroplakia or erythroleukoplakia varicose hyperplasia patients who have premalignant lesions on high risk sites like tongue floor of mouth and hard palate these are high risk sites so high risk sites and high risk lesions if i feel there is a palpable induration then that's again another very high risk um, uh, uh, lesion and high risk indication for surgery um besides these you will also if the patient is very apprehensive if the patient has no history of any tobacco usage so that's one of the one of the areas where uh, you may consider resection so if you have uh, lady patients who have not used tobacco and you find that they have premalignant lesions and this is one of the group of patients where you may consider resections rather than when you have tobacco usage as a, a significant factor uh, so high risk sites and high risk lesions are what uh, will determine whether you want to operate premalignant lesions definitely every erythroleukoplakia i will operate and uh, most to most premalignant lesions on the tongue and floor mouth will undergo resections ma'am in today's scenario where we are not only just uh, fighting against cancer but also covid there are some cases where there would be white additions on the gingiva in due to covid also so how do we distinguish it clinically from the premalignant lesions so uh, i did read that question i must say i have don't have any experience of too many patients coming to me with these white uh, additions on the gingiva post covid so my experience in this is not very high so i i'm i'm not sure i've seen too many of these lesions but i think it's important to understand that in differentiating premalignant lesions from this covid lesions you must have chronology so if you had a covid um uh, infection and then you developed these lesions what you need to do is you need to give time to wait and look at what happens to these lesions rather, rather than just running forward and uh, taking a biopsy from these lesions so you have to take a good history from these patients that these lesions were not present before these patients had covid and then these patients developed covid and got these lesions then you probably know it's related to the covid wait for some time i assume that these lesions are lesions which will reverse and then you come back and see the patient after 3 to 4 weeks and if if that is what it is i must say i do not have much experience so what is the time required for these covid lesions to regress i do not know uh, but you will see that most of them will regress and then probably you don't need to take a biopsy so i wouldn't think there's a hurry to take a biopsy if you have a good chronology and good history that these lesions came after the covid uh, diagnosis dr nishit what is your take on this question is dr nishit with us am i am i sorry 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 i'm sorry <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah uh, actually i have not came across any white lesions on the gingiva but the tongue yeah of course i have came across such a lesions but yeah uh, as madam said that uh, normally the white lesion the straight away should not go for biopsy even after covid you know because uh, even as such uh, when i found uh, when i found any white lesions on the on the common locations uh, uh, with the patient with uh, proper chronology like habit uh, long habit or something then also i don't uh, directly jump into the biopsy actually we have to see the chronological factors and then we have to go for the biopsy and uh, most of the time if you take biopsy of the white lesions from the gingiva they don't show uh, as such much with uh, of course of course with proper chronology and i think i don't think gingiva is a common site for the biopsy normally the biopsies are taken uh, from uh, the red and white lesions at the margin only so most of the times so uh, i think uh, i would uh, agree with uh, gauri madam on that that uh, we should uh, wait and watch and uh, uh, one more uh, uh, i'm sorry but one more question about the candidiasis for there was there yes so candidiasis should not be go- going for the biopsy because whatever the lesions which are uh, uh, in the category of exclusions are the lesions which can be treated otherwise right so once the lesions can be treated otherwise like uh, you can uh, give uh, any uh, clotrimazole paint or uh, maybe systemic uh, antifungals if it can be treated then it should not go for biopsy why it should go for biopsy right and as such uh, it is like as far as being a dentist and uh, being a general practitioner it is uh, sometimes like i am not that much empathetic to the patient but it is our duty to prevent unnecessary biopsy also 
right whenever you can yeah it is if if it is in your clinical knowledge and you can uh, prevent unnecessary biopsy of course and whenever it is doubt definitely it should go for biopsy so there are uh, thank you dr nishit there has many questions but i think these are questions more pertinent for the upcoming sessions on the next week next sundays so i would not take their questions because of time constraint just two rapid questions i'll take before we go to the panel the first is dr nishit only uh, how do you counsel your patients for the opmd which you found in the opportunistic screening process how do you counsel them <laughs> uh, uh, like uh, in the screening process like uh, whenever we found this like uh, i can say uh almost uh, every other patient who are who are having a, a history of habits uh mostly uh, they are having some or other lesions normally uh, what we do is uh, we inform every patient uh, about uh, such kind of lesions right and uh, like if you uh, see the research i i would not uh, uh, point out my practice or maybe general practice but if you see the research uh i have came across a research in which uh, out of uh, in united states almost 3% of the patient go uh, goes for the biopsy and out of that 3% 5% are being positive for old squamous cell carcinoma so that's uh, a lot of difference so but yeah of course i would keep on trying to convince the patient for uh, uh going for further screening maybe biopsy or maybe stopping the habit or something like that right and sorry yes ma'am yeah yes is good good yeah so uh, that's what uh, we do in our practice and that's why i advise uh, every other fellow to do in the practice just uh, keep on trying because uh, this is the way uh, we can you know educate the people about uh, the habits as well as for the outcomes okay um, i have more lot of questions but i think these will somewhere come in the panel only but last question to nishit again dr nishit what is your la, uh, final take that um, more or less what is your preferable biopsy type and the site that's the uh, last question i'm taking um, uh, this is uh, dr krishna kumar can we discuss these questions in the panel because it will be a repetition okay fine fine so that is wonderful if i have my enthusiastic moderator to start the panel over to you i would like uh, the chairpersons of this uh, panel to please join in dr vijay mathur dr bhavna dave and dr prashant shah and dr purushottam chavan but i hand it over to dr krishna kumar and uh, it's my privilege to invite him he is a professor department of head and neck surgery and oncology amrita institute of medical sciences kochi uh, reputed uh, uh, journals he has been he has been assistant editor to the journal of head and neck physician and surgeon associate editor to the frontiers journal oto rangio in head and neck surgery and oral surgery Uh, very important positions at various uh, important associations and uh, more than 190 uh, publications to uh, reputed journals and he has been very enthusiastic today for his panel so over to you straight forward uh just, just a minute uh, uh, dr krishna just to for everyone because we had a lot of questions so there is a community page which i have put uh everyone can just uh, log in or uh, just join the community page and we will put all the question and answer there from the uh, from the speakers from the faculty we'll take the answers and we we'll put it there so just for everyone just there is this uh, i'm putting it again for the benefit of everyone just join the community page and you can do it right now it will just take 30 seconds over to you dr krishna sorry for intervening no problems uh good afternoon everyone uh, can i share my screen now yes please yes please can we introduce the panelists yeah it is there okay sorry yeah uh, so the panel uh, you have heard a lot about uh, managing potentially malignant disorders of the cavity uh, oral cavity but i'll be dealing on uh, the practical uh, tips and management aspects there will be a lot of repetitions i guess and uh, today on the panel we have uh, uh, dr mitesh patel who is a maxillofacial surgeon pavan sinhal jan shah maxillofacial surgeon again ashok das is a surgical oncologist and reena kumar a dental surgeon dr akshit malik another surgical oncologist Uh, dr reshmi shukla radiation oncologist manmohan 
Agarwal, a surgical oncologist, and a pathologist, Dr. Riti Agarwal, and uh, one more radiation oncologist, Dr. Hardik Patel. Are they all here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. We just, uh, yeah. So this is my first case. We'll be, we'll be going mm, through a series of uh, simple cases which we all come across in our uh, clinic. So this is a leukopenia, very clear. Uh, it's defined as a white patch or a plaque on the oral mucosa that cannot be removed by scraping and cannot be classified clinically or microscopically as another disease entity. Uh, my question to all the surgeons here, Dr. Mitesh, when will you consider biopsy in such lesions and what type of biopsy you will do? Dr. Hello. Mitesh, Dr. Yes, Mitesh. Am, am I audible? Yes, you are. Sir, when I find the history of the long term uh, lesion having a history of a long term duration, this uh, size is more than one centimeter, is uh, I feel some nodular nodularity in there, thicken or splackal lesion is there. Then okay. I will prefer the biopsy. Okay, you saw uh, so nodularity and speckleness uh, and duration are the uh, uh, things which you consider. Dr. Pawan, uh, what are your considerations? When will you think of a biopsy or will you just observe? Pawan, are you here? Pawan Singh? Yeah, yeah. Pawan Singh will be up. So it is like uh, it's a variegated yeah. appearance or just he told us about the nodality and all. It might be erythroleukoplakia, then I'll certainly go for a biopsy down there. And it is mm. two, more than two centimeter for me in my uh, like practice. I prefer taking a biopsy in a lesion which is more than two centimeter, which is there for more than three months uh, altogether. And then there are some changes patient has observed or I have observed on routine on routine follow-ups of the patient, like color change in color or change in the texture, nodularity or spread of lesion, all those things, I'll go for a biopsy. Some of them you may observe also. That's what you're trying to yeah. say. So yes. when do you observe? Like a homogeneous lesions or yeah. something? So I, I observe less than two centimeter lesions, which are homogeneous, which are flat, usually flat, and yeah. which are white, okay. not uh, speckled sort of thing. Right. Uh, Dr. Gunjan Shah. Uh, what sort of biopsy will you do? Uh, will you prefer to do an excision, a punch, an incision? What do you do? Dr. Gunjan Shah is here. He's not here. Ashok, uh, uh, Ashok, are you here? Hello? Dr. Okay, Gunjan Shah. Yeah, Ashok. My question was, uh, you saw the lesion. It's a pretty homogeneous lesion. Uh, so, uh, right. when will you consider biopsy in such lesions and what sort of biopsy? Yes, uh, okay, okay. actually, uh, uh, this, uh, as you have shown it very clearly, it's a homogeneous lesion. So, uh, first, mm -hmm. I would like to go for uh, some counseling and all. Uh, I am not uh, very keen to do a biopsy unless and until I found some uh, indurated area over oh, that yeah. uh, whole lesion. And if at all yeah, I yeah. found any induration kind of thing, then I will go for an incisional biopsy because it's pans. The induration is one thing. Yes, yes. So if I, found, is one. if I found any indurated area, then I'll go for. Okay. Uh, Dr. Akshat, are you here? Uh, what is your policy? Yes, sir. Uh, so regarding the biopsy, I'll prefer doing an incisional biopsy. Incisional biopsy. And, and uh, uh, what do you do? Do you use some like staining like uh, AIDS, you know, the uh, uh, Lugol side in all those things. Will you, uh, do you prefer? I, I have used NBI previously, but then uh, like yeah, NBI for the audience to say NBI is narrow band imaging. Narrow band imaging, yes, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, along with that, uh, but currently in my practice, I am just using naked eye examination and I go as per my clinical acumen at present. Right. Uh, I would also mention. That I would also mention. Yeah. So they, they, these uh, heterogeneous lesions, you know, they can be also associated with some uh, tooth trauma and all. I would right. prefer waiting for some time before going ahead with biopsy if I can see the inciting factor out there. Right. Uh, Do you? Uh, so I'll show you this lesion. 
Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Mitesh again, uh, what is your uh, change in policy when you come to this lesion? Mitesh, are you here? Yeah, yes, sir. This is a very widespread lesion. So definitely, sir, yeah. we are not excised completely, but we can yeah. take a biopsy. Will what you take it? a biopsy? Yeah. yeah, it's a more rep representable area. We will take the incisional biopsy first. Which will be the more representative areas from this diagram? Uh, like uh, here, I, you can see some red, whitish areas, thickened areas. You can see some red areas. Sir, so which area will you prefer? Sir, I like to take a biopsy from the right and white mixed yeah. area is there. It is a yeah. more representative. I took another biopsy for the most thickened area of the lesion. Okay. And so you uh, take a multiple biops. In such lesions, yeah. you take multiple biops. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah, if it is yes, a heterogeneous lesion, you go for a multiple biopsy. Yeah, uh, yes. Akshat, anything to add? Do you, do you risk stratify such lesions? Definitely. So that is uh, part of the history taking as well. Uh, we need to know about the addiction status and how long they have the, had the lesion for. Uh, that thing apart. How do you how do you risk stratify? Leukoplakia, leukoerythroplakia. Gauri, uh, Dr. Gauri was uh, hinting to, uh, she yes, told something yes, about Definitely. It. So, uh, first of all, uh, whether it is heterogeneous, the site of the leukoplakia, whether it is tongue, floor of mouth, and RMT, they, uh, they are the highest sites. So, I would, of course, be wary about such lesions. Besides that, if it is uh, heterogeneous yeah. or there is some induration involved or it's erythroleukoplakia, uh, or uh, if the patient is uh, a non-addict, then also I will be uh, eager to take a biopsy or at least have my suspicion higher. Okay. So the key point is that uh, uh, we have to risk stratify. We have to try to distinguish between a high risk lesion and uh, 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 am I audible? Low risk lesions and uh, low risk, risk lesions, we may, maybe we can uh, wait a little bit, but high risk lesions will demand uh, uh, biopsy and appropriate management. So we have uh, Dr. Riti Agarwal, our pathologist. Uh, what biopsy do you prefer, an incision biopsy or a punch biopsy? If you are to give some suggestions to surgeons, what will you say to them? How do you want the surgeon to do a biopsy? Dr. Riti Agarwal. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. Yes, sir. Sir, as a pathologist, uh, if I discuss this case, like it's a heterogeneous lesion, so I would prefer multiple biopsies. Yeah. And the two yeah. important things that we look for is depth and uh, in C2 change or dysplastic change. And the second yeah. thing which I already mentioned in my lecture also in my talk, that yeah. we need to see the relationship of the adjacent normal mucosa with okay. the lesional change that is happening yeah. there. So many times what happens is if it is a varicose or a, you know, a keratotic plaque or anything like that, if the surgeon takes only the punch. So I get what I see in my pathology is just the hyperplastic, hyperkeratotic uh, lesion is there. And which in case we embed it very flat because there's no depth to it. So right. it's, it's of no use in a way. It's, it's so not, the point is very clear, very clear. You have yeah. made it. So you prefer a deep biopsy yeah. and you prefer a normal tissue along Yeah, with the very much. And especially if the surgeon is uh, has him having his own clinical acumen because sometimes, you know, they really tell us that it's a very poor lesion. We are very sure about that. So in so, those cases, until and unless the surgeon has his own limitation of trismus or any other thing, we would like to have a biopsy, which in case, if not deep, at least with the adjacent normal mucosa. Right. So I got your point. So yeah. what, uh, to summarize what you said, you need a deep biopsy. You yes, prefer sir. an incisional biopsy rather than punch biopsy because the punch biopsy yeah. can be the center of the lesions and yeah. better include some normal tissue. Definitely. And uh, if possible, get multiple uh, uh, biopsies uh, if the lesions are heterogeneous. Heterogeneous, That's, definitely. Those are very good points. Now, oh, my additional question, what do you look in this specimen specifically? And what so, are your challenges? Uh, specifically, whenever we get a biopsy, uh, see the size doesn't really matter at times. If I yeah. can really make out that I can see some bases there to the biopsy. So yeah. from the very start, the grossing happens and the bending happens. We make it sure that we have the proper plane to the uh, section. We make it sure that we do not embed it flat. We embed it in a vertical plane yeah. so that I know that I can see the mucosa, I can see the deeper tissue, and so uh, the alignment is there. 
and uh, that is what and in case the clinician yeah. is very sure it is not a suit epithelomatous though you cannot see any deep change or anything we go for serial deep cuts and we take the help of immunohistochemistry ck also a simple cytokeratin at times is so helpful especially in inflammatory lesions where you are not sure that single cell infiltration is there or not so in those cases right. this ck really highlights the spastic cells which were you know we were missing out in because of the inflammatory background Dr. Kunjan Shah, what do as a surgeon, what do you expect from the pathologist's report? The most important part. Uh, Dr. Kunjan has not joined. Dr. Kunjan Shah is now. Mithali, I'm sorry, I, I missed you. Dr. Mithali Dandekar, uh, is she? Yes, there? yes, very much. Okay, Dr. Mitali. So here's a question. As a surgeon, what do you want to hear from the pathologist? So, uh, as I've been listening to this uh, panel, uh, two important things is uh, predominantly all these oral premalignant lesions are clinical as far as the clinical judgment of the clinician goes. And yeah. secondly, yes, if you go ahead with an incision biopsy, as you correctly discussed, uh, yeah. I would be looking for the amount or the measure of the dysplasia. Predominantly, dysplasia. Yeah. dysplasia. Yeah. Whether it is severe right. dysplasia or carcinoma in situ, and it would probably help me to make a better judgment call as to whether I should go ahead with a complete resection, or if the patient is apprehensive, I can still give him an option of very close follow-up. Okay, so that's what I wanted to hear from you. The word dysplasia. So, uh, uh, Doctor Riti, again. So, uh, how do you comment on this dysplasia, dysplasia aspect? There is some confusion, or uh, like you know, your binary system and uh, yes, sir. What is that? What is it? How sir, do you actually, do you earlier we uh, not earlier also still there is you know uh, two schools of thought in which one is mild, moderate, and severe, which really follows like how much loss of polarity has, has happened yeah. as we move from the. Uh, Uh, towards the superficial layers, and the, now what is so? What is this binary system? So uh, now it's like low, uh, low grade, and high grade. Where in high grade they have a uh, uh, club moderate and severe. Right. Yeah, and uh, again, uh, Doctor Mitesha, uh, how will you, uh, this grading of dysplasia help you in your management? Uh, so definitely, we are. Uh, If the low grade and uh, is a mild or moderate, so we can observe closely. Observe the hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hearing. It is a low grade or as a mild moderate uh, uh, dysplasia, so we can observe and a close follow up. Again, yeah. if it's severe uh, severe dysplasia, so we like to excise. It's uh, excise fully. Okay. Yes. Right. If it's mild dysplasia, you may observe. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, two radiation oncologists, Dr. Roshni Shukla and Dr. Hardik Patel. I'll show you uh, this lesion. Is there any role for radiation therapy in this such cases? Uh, the surgeons were saying they are going to excise, but how much they will do excision? It's good. they just are going to come back. So, is there any role for radiation therapy in this case, Dr. Roshni Shukla? She here. Dr. Shukla is she here or Hardik Patel? I don't think they are here. Hello, uh, Dr. Hardik, are you there? No, both of them are not there. Ah, okay, all right. Uh, so this is a difficult uh, uh, lesion to treat. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pawan, uh, how are you going to how are you going to excise this whole mouth? Ah, uh, no doubt, it is very difficult to do that. Yeah, maybe I'll be I'll be doing it in piece meals, right? And uh, because I can't I can't take a, a all block a dissection for a dissection of this lesion as such. But you asked yeah. about radiations um, uh, oncologist opinion. I think uh, in such lesion it can yeah. upgrade upgrade the up, up stage the tumor in these lesions. But of course, yeah, radiation have, therapy is usually not uh, advised. Yes, it is not advised. So no yeah. doubt this lesion, if it turns out to be a moderate to severe dysplasia or maybe a carcinoma in C2, I will have to take it out. Right, and it is difficult in, in such a, a situation. Although it is difficult to do this, uh, I will okay. have to take the margin also. Yeah. Okay. Can I make it? Okay. Problem? Yes. Yes, Ashok. Come on. You have a better way of taking this out, Ashok. Hello, Ashok. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
Oh, okay. Thing is that suppose in this particular patients, as uh, patient is having a good mouth opening, and there is a yeah. huge areas of you know involvement. So yeah. even I don't mind to take a opinion from the radiation oncologist because uh, just exercising. Yeah. No, the no problem uh, here is no. This are the yeah. Pick up. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I understand your point, but the problem is, you know, many of the many areas will be just displaced here. They are not truly malignant, so radiation therapy won't work. You know, we are, you know, it's a difficult situation. We all agree. Let's move on. Uh, May I just interject for a minute? Yes, please, uh, uh, Akshat. In the previous picture which we were showing, I would not go ahead with the excision of the complete thing. I would, like we discussed previously, we'll be taking multiple biopsies. Yeah. And I would take out the. most unhealthy part or depending on the dysplasia report only that particular area with few millimeter margins i understand that the entire mucosa is having yeah. changes but then we cannot keep running after that and uh, okay. that, that's a common thing which we find in a practice yeah. let's all agree that it is a difficult lesion and sometimes we do get such difficult lesions so we have a dental surgeon here uh, dr reena kumar uh how do you manage a leukoplakia in a dental clinic is there a situation when you decide that you will refer the patient to a higher center than do a biopsy and then refer uh, thank you and dr krishna kumar yeah thank you dr krishna kumar for the question yeah. and i am yeah. pleased to be here on the panel yeah. so where uh, oral cancer is concerned and where a dental clinic is concerned i think the role there is huge because uh, we yeah. really need to understand that a, a Uh, a patient visits a dental clinic and that's often considered the first point of care and the first point right. of contact right. so early detection would be very important and to reduce the mortality rate of these patients suffering from oral cancer that's why i guess is a you know there's got to be a large amount of demand i think we all have to draw in for non invasive rapid and easy to use techniques for early detection and i think where this is concerned right. now there are two aspects to it one is of course educating our patient and the other is educating our uh, clinicians you know that even Absolutely. it doesn't matter what you what the patient comes to you for whether it is an orthodontic treatment or whether it is a, a xyz implant yeah. treatment but you are mandated to look inside the mouth and actually do a, 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 a you know visual examination so that is a mandatory thing and at the same time take a very uh, intense yeah. history one is of course about where is the patient coming right. from because if the patient is located in certain parts of the country and especially in the northeast or wherever yeah. where we have a lot of male population and over that the female is overriding that you know the female right. population which is coming up with oral cancers is higher in these areas and in the central india so in okay. such a situation we would like to understand what are the factors so how much is the patient consuming tobacco the the yeah. betel nut quid alcohol smoking what are the risk factors happening and yeah. how much is it all this contributing to what is happening in the mouth so that's yeah. important and of course a visual yeah. examination <laughs> you saying something dr yeah, dr krishna kumar go ahead okay so what i would do sorry, sorry, what sorry, i would do yeah. or i would teach my student to do would be probably to do a visual examination try to see whether this lesion can mm -hmm. be a, a white lesion which can be wiped off or not can it be scraped off can it mm -hmm. be not scraped off so make one decision over there and from there on you know um, uh, probably the better thing would be to call in and take an opinion because it is very very important and if there is a habit which is strong habit is there along with that you see subcutaneous fibrosis asm ome osm and then along with that there is leukoplakia erythroplakia and the leukoerythroplakia is happening and various uh, plaque lesions happening i think uh, the need for looking at uh, uh, various uh, going into further screening you know the screening would include uh, let's say beyond physical examination which would be uh, we would do a physical examination which we a systematic visual examination and palpation lymph nodes salivary glands lips inspect everything along and yeah. along with that probably a histopathological inspection but most importantly i think today's day the the role of the stains which have come in as i think you were talking about that also yeah. you asked somebody about it so that was a really yeah. nice question i thought really nice yeah. uh, suggestion from your side because i think yeah. the visual staining technique which we are all used to be doing at olidin blue and now with uh, things which have come up uh, in the form of uh, our stains which are this um, what are these things which we have these um, um i forget the name the optical coherence and then we have it's different it's kinds immediate. by which we get yeah. visual imaging yes so yes that's, so that's right yeah. yes i'm just forgetting so, the name just question. now last question is there yes, a role of, yeah this uh, you know we hear a lot about this breast self examination yes. so 
Uh, is there a role of mouth self examination prevention and uh, absolutely early as i said dr krishna kumar that there are two role to it one is educating the patient and the other is educating the doctor the clinician so we're educating the patient concerned is one about good habits of course and the other is examining your mouth and examining your mouth and we have that chart very clear chart the eight point check we have so the patient yeah. is taught how to use the eight point check and of course the mouth opening because that's the simplest thing that a person can do how much is your mouth opening is your mouth opening four fingers or having reduced mouth opening and are you having any kind of lesions in the mouth do you have an associated habit and what really is going on so in that case you are educating your patient to look at himself empowering and we at i can care have two things which we have you know which is very interesting i'm sorry this is an i can care uh, event so i would really like to bring that up also because we have a digital uh, app you know it's a i can care app wherein the patient is empowered yes the we empower the patient not just by education but he can download this little thing on his mobile and he can actually check to see whether his mouth opening is correct or not and he can actually get uh, educated by that that's number one and of course these charts which are available and they are so it is a clinician's duty to educate himself and to educate the patient and the families on both aspects one is of course good healthy health behavior and the third most and the second most important thing i would say is self examination and assessing yourself and coming in for a, you can really change the progression of the disease and what can be a, a you know what can really be a issue because we we all understand that Uh, that if an oral mucosal examination can effectively reduce oral cancer rate by forty percent, mortality by forty percent, okay. and the five-year so, survival rate is very so, high. Those studies have shown that. Yes, yeah. Doctor. So let me conclude uh, by saying that dental clinics and the primary uh, area of uh, uh, contact areas has a great role to play Absolutely. in preventing uh, and diagnosing early uh, cancers. Good management I, there and good education there. Thank you yeah. so much. thank you uh, so to summarize this for first part of the panel homogeneous and heterogeneous uh, leukoplakes can be there uh, non homogeneous can be speckled and nodular or verrucous the annual malignant transformation rate for all types of leukoplakes is around 1% and we have risk stratification and degree of dysplasia on biopsy is a major point on uh, risk stratification the other points like female gender older patients uh, larger lesions non homogeneous lateral ventral tongue floor of the mouth lesions and of course some biomarkers which we don't usually do and the presence of dysplasia is a single most significant predictor of malignant transformation and some visual uh, staining and odofluorescence and uh, narrow band imaging may do some help especially in identifying the high risk lesions and taking a biopsy and uh, uh, we talked about uh, the uh, 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 the steps to prevent the Uh, recurrence of these lesions. So, uh, one last question in this hey, point, uh, Doctor uh, Mithali, uh, how would you uh, look into this habit cessation and chemo prevention? How will you prevent these lesions? I'm coming back. Okay. So, to answer the second point first, uh, as of today, uh, we know there are uh, studies which are ongoing. The curcumin trial. but really uh, nothing that suggests level 1 evidence to uh, prescribe a cream of preventive drugs to all these patients yeah. and coming on to the first point in fact that is the single most important advice and counseling that uh, one must give to these patients because like we've been discussing uh, uh, for the last 20 minutes or so uh, these are very complex lesions it just doesn't come in the single 2 cm lesion on the heart palate which we go ahead and excise there will be multiple uh, field cancerization uh, lesions uh, in the mouth uh, all over the oral cavity and removing all of them is not an easy task so habit cessation is of course of utmost importance in fact if it is a low risk lesion i would not really jump the panic button and go ahead and excise it in fact i would uh, give the patient enough time a window period like we say uh, for yeah. cessation of habits and then go ahead and prioritize the lesions and then decide for the management Correct. All right. Uh, so, chemo prevention is defined as an administration of agents to reverse a carcinogenesis. Not very successful. Different agents like retinoids, beta carotene, vitamin E, selenium, COX two inhibitors, and curcumin have been tried, but uh, not of much use. Uh, Doctor uh, Mitesh, uh, do you have any experience on this curcumin? Anybody has? Uh, anybody can answer that question. Uh, curcumin. 
Dr. Palman? May Ashok. I come in? May I come in, please? Yes, please. Uh, curcumin has worked very well with our patients and, uh, uh, you know, there are certain formulations, especially for a, a patient with oral submucous fibrosis, where yeah. we have um, uh, Curin's gargle, which consists of uh, uh, curcumin and based it along with a few other products, really helps out and eases out and helps yeah. along with the exercising, especially when we give them a dress care and for mouth yeah. opening exercises. Along with that, it kind of loosens up the muscular tissue in there and the collagen tissue kind of loosens up and the patient is definitely better off. And curcumin has been tried in by many um, uh, dental uh, you know, research products, researchers, and it has shown to have major improvements. Yes. And our uh, product of uh, one of the products, which is uh, Tris, which is um, uh, Turin's Gargle, I think by uh, Pneumatis Sundumis. It's a very good product because we do give it to our patients all the patients with oral submucous fibrosis for gargle and um, uh, rehabilitation during right. the mouth opening process. Yeah, so Thank curcumin you. has some role. So this is like summarizing the lesion. Uh, we risk stratify, it is a low risk, uh, high risk lesion excision. Uh, low risk uh, lesions, you can uh, remove the irritant factors and uh, follow up these uh, lesions. And, and uh, if they are progressing, we may have to consider uh, uh, excision now a special some special situations a small leukoplakia okay with some red, little bit uh, reddish areas uh pavan uh how what do you do do you do an incision biopsy and excision biopsy and what margins will you take will you do some imaging before this uh i think this lesion because it has got a reddish nodularity down there i'll take uh, i'll go for an excisional biopsy with taking around two three mm margins yeah. Yeah. All along. And what if the and biopsy comes as invasive squamous cell carcinoma? This is a common tricky situation, you know. You <laughs> excise it close and suddenly the uh, report comes as uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So how do and you... I'll revise, I'll revise the lesion with supramoid neck dissection at least. Right. If it turns out to be invasive carcinoma. Akshat, Akshat, uh, uh, how do you do that? So, in fact, I had one case uh, in January which was quite similar. Yeah. Superficial lesion and uh, on excisional biopsy, it came out to be SEC with depth of invasion just one millimeter. Yeah. Uh, I went ahead. So you excise the lesion, and uh, if it is surgical lesion, you may go for a staged neck dissection. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So even in this case, I revised my margins and I did a neck dissection. Okay. Uh, like Dr. Bobin mentioned, we do take few millimeters margins, but then they do come down. And for CA purpose, we require yeah. more margins. We cannot leave it at that. Right. Um, uh, Dr. Reena, uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, you know, okay, so we see this traumatic ulcers. Uh, so how do you differentiate between uh, uh, problematic lesion and the traumatic ulcers? Anybody can take this. Uh, Dr. Reena, I was asking you, here's a picture of uh, uh, traumatic ulcers. How do you uh, differentiate and counsel your patient that it is uh, not a problem? Can you hear me? I think she's not hearing me. Hello? Dr. Pavan. Yes. Hello? Uh, uh, Dr. Krishna, I'll uh, at first uh, convince the patient that it is uh, not malignant sort of thing. It yeah. looks more like traumatic because it is flat. It has yeah. done, doesn't have hyperemic margins. Yeah. So at first, I'll see to the inciting factor which has caused this lesion. So it might be the teeth, right. uh, a sharp teeth. So I'll refer the case to dental surgeon. He will just polish the teeth and yeah. the job is done. But if it is not being corrected after that, within two weeks or three weeks, then of course, good, I'll, I'll go and take, take it out. It's a very Don't critical part. May I come in, please? Yes. Please. It's a very critical thing that these sharp teeth should be really uh, managed because these uh, chronic uh, trauma can again lead to something which is, uh, you know, we do know what it ends up with. So what really starts out as a small traumatic ulcer might have a long term, yeah. uh, uh, you know, not negative prognosis. As a result, they have to be identified, informed to the patient and attended to by the dental clinic. 
Right. So these are usually short lasting. The causal traumatic event has to be clearly identified and uh, uh, dealt with. And uh, they, these lesions don't have any durations and they usually heal. And if not healing in two to three weeks, then you should go for a, a biopsy. And two special situations uh, uh, like uh, proliferative verrucous leukoplakia and chronic hyperplastic candidia. Uh, Dr. Riti, uh, uh, how do you diagnose this? Riti is here. Dr. Riti, pathology. Hello. I think network issue dropped up. I will connect with her and oh. get her. All right. Uh, Dr. Ashok, do you have some experience on these two lesions? Do you see them occasionally? Or any, any of the surgeons? See them occasionally. And uh, believe me, it's really every top situation. Right. The first one, uh, this proliferative verifies leukoplakia. But uh, again, coming to the basic, we look for uh, any induration, mostly yeah. back on that induration, that clinical findings. And if I got any suspicious uh, induration, then I will definitely go for an incisional biopsy and uh, manage accordingly. And the second is, yes, it's, a, it's in clinical uh, diagnosis with a median uh, this thing. So uh, we take uh, we we take help of medications and uh, that's that's right. all. Right. Like anybody any 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 difference of opinion here? Uh, anybody gives antifungal therapy for this chronic hyperplastic uh, antidiasis? Uh, doctor. Yes, uh, doctor uh, Rina. Yes, we do because uh, this hyperplastic candidiasis are often that uh, you know the, there is uh, an issue of a fungal infection, overlying fungal infection. So do we we do give a long term uh, uh, antifungal uh, it, treatment is given? Yes, we do give it. But uh, when you were going to say? yeah yeah, but these okay. are nightmare cases. I'm telling you because okay. these, uh, when I palpate this tongue over the dorsum of chronic hyperplastic candidiasis. I am under yeah. suspicion because most of these lesions are formed to hard. Yeah. Uh, at some places, you will find formed to hard lesions. So at first, yeah. go for anti-fungal. Uh, if it is not getting any anything uh, relief, then I'll take yeah, a biopsy. Yeah, I'll biopsy take a and excision. And these are lesions that, which have high chance of uh, malignant transformations. So yes. moving on from leukoplakia to lichen planus, the second lesions, very uh, commonly we see and not very difficult to diagnose, diagnose uh, uh, on the tongue and on the buccal striated lesions. And uh, sometimes we can also see uh, the lichenoid lesions, lichen planus and lichenoid lesions. Okay, uh, so... Um, Dr. Mitesh, uh, how do you explain this to the patients? Do you take a biopsy? How do you manage? How do you differentiate between lichen planus and lichen node lesions? Dr. Mitesh? Dr. Gunjan is here now. Mitali again. Uh, Dr. Mitali? Yeah. So, uh, uh, the first and foremost, am I audible? Audible. Sorry. You are audible, Matali. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, like we've been reiterating over and over again, uh, all these white lesions, red lesions in the mouth are a clinical judgment call. Uh, anything that appears suspicious, yeah. uh, which we have discussed at large, anything which is indurated, anything which is nodular, speckled, uh, we will not wait and watch. Lichen planus, typically, yeah. like you've been showing in your pictures, they have these reticular whitish striae, uh, and they are mainly symmetrical, yeah. mostly on either side, show, uh, give typical history of waxing and waning with time. Uh, so I'll ask my patients to take it easy with them. Yes, they would have symptoms of burning sensations and uh, would like to observe them uh, with medical management. Akshat, how do you differentiate between this lichenoid lesion and the lichen plants? Uh, Akshat? So it will, uh, that depends on the biopsy only. Clinically, if there is some minimal induration, probably yes, but then it's very difficult to differentiate. I, I would still biopsy these lesions. Uh, in fact, uh, in right. UK, where uh, I was practicing earlier, there 
we had less number of oral cancer patients but we had many patients with similar looking lesions who used to come up right. and we had to biopsy it before uh, saying that it's uh, lichen planus or not yeah that's a good point uh, dr rina you are yes i want to add something because you see a lichenoid reaction is we see a lot of it in the dental clinic because uh, uh, most of it is actually a reaction to something which is a con the tissues have been in contact with yeah. so this could be a metallic restoration because yeah, there might be a factor Yes, there's always a factor. The yeah. cause effect factor has to be really found, and it is easily found because you yeah. see there are there are patients who are wearing dentures, and many times if the dentures are not made in proper clinic, then you have this yeah. um, monomer which is still leaching out, and if it has not been heat cured and done properly, then what drugs are they using? It's very yeah. important to take that, and also the restorative because the old time fillings are all the silver am amalgam, and is there something which is happening Maybe. a galvanic current, and what really is going on? So it's basically an antigen fixing of the ep epithelial cell. So I believe that. a very good protocol of history as we followed in here and the lichenoid reactions can be recognized in a dental clinic pretty easily right so it's a complex chronic inflammatory yeah. disease that uh, it's about one to percent immune mediated malignant transformation of oil piece less than one person uh, reticular erosion dangerous i guess with a little more of uh, uh, malignant transformation like not lesions usually have this associations like drugs uh, dental restorative materials and uh, this graft versus host disease that such history has to be properly taken as uh, dr rena was commenting and uh, uh, clinically they are usually unilateral you agree yeah, uh, and uh, like you know like in planus lesions are bilateral a little more of malignant uh, I yes. have seen a very Dr. interesting lichenoid lesion in when a patient who had a gold restoration and a silver restoration. So you see, there was a galvanic current set up inside the mouth, and yeah. there was a cell which had been formed. So as a result, on both sides, this patient had this very severe lichenoid uh, because it was like a electrical cell which had been created in it with two electrodes, one silver and one gold, you know, sitting in there, silver amalgam filling and a and a gold restoration. So right. uh, it was uh, quite a unique one, and it's been reported by us. Yeah. So always uh, the point is always look for some factors which are responsible like uh, drugs history or uh, like dental and amalgams and then you can suspect uh, uh, like anoid lesions and otherwise uh, if it is uh, uh, typical picture of uh, like planus lesions and uh, mind you both these are can very very rarely uh, turn to be malignant uh now let's come to the last uh, lesion for the day uh, submucous fibrosis we heard about that uh, in detail but uh, just to sum up some practical tips uh, uh, from you all clinicians uh, dr mitesh is he back dr gunjan yes. is he here uh, how do you prevent uh, yeah please how do you prevent these lesions in uh, in your clinic some mucus fibrosis hello prevent or progress hello, hello sir yes my question is about a sub mucus fibrosis how do you prevent the progression hello mitesh unmute yourself please hello yeah we can hear you mitesh go ahead mitesh hello yeah, hello sir please go ahead yeah go ahead most of patient having submucous fibrosis having a history of betel nut chewing or uh, tobacco chewing okay. so we have to first stop quit the habit stop quit the habit then uh, just uh, do the physiotherapy as much as yeah. possible so this is the best two yeah, way to prevent yeah. the submucous fibrosis yeah. may i come in dr krishna kumar please yeah very good dr krishna kumar if you allow me any role for some nutritional uh, you know yes sir i generally yes, yes, patient ask to have a balanced diet yes please. balanced diet and then uh, then yes, we sir. generally yes, use the please. carotenoids and this medicine for a long term yeah may i come in dr krishna kumar if you permit me right uh, dr rina yeah 
Yeah, I don't know why. Can you hear me? Because sure. it's showing that I'm muted. Okay. So right. how do you prevent the progression? Yeah. So Dr. I Reina, think please. I believe I believe that the best thing is prevention. So prevention is of course a good habit, good counseling, yes, so get rid of that is yes, number one. We all number two. You. Number two is what we would do is mouth opening. So we have developed at I Can Care a beautiful, simple tool, which is called a Tris Care, which is the patient is given and he can, yeah. he or she can place it in the mouth and open it. And there is a grading scale, which tells us to how much is the mouth opening, which has happened and how much does it open and progressively do this. Along with that, there are gargles, as I said, and along with that, there are micronutrients, which are given. So there are vitamin E, C, D, and uh, uh, these are given to the patient with lycopene. Yeah. So, uh, so all this put together really works for the patient. So, but the most important thing is to continue working on the mouth opening. And that yeah. is with an instrument called Triscare, which we have developed at Icon Care. It really works very well. And uh, it's a very small, adaptable, a lot of instruments, of course, are available in the market, starting from simple gadgets of, uh, you know, little elastic modules, all the way down to this. So uh, basically, it is about um, the okay, habit stopping. Really Really I would yes. request you to put all these. Uh, the, I would request you to put all these. Uh, you know the uh, pro, uh, thing, uh, the gadgets you're telling or the uh, in the chat box so that so that Thank the you. audience. We do that. We do that. Thank you. Yeah. Right. And uh, regarding the management, Mitali, uh, uh, this uh, placentrex extract, steroid injections, uh, have they worked in your hands? So uh, a point uh, one must understand about submucous fibrosis is it goes through gradings. It goes through four classical steps. The initial uh, stage one and stage two are the early changes, wherein there is more of mucosal congestion. The fibroblasts are just setting in. And it yeah. is the advanced stage, actually, where the fibroblasts become more mature. The blood vessels actually undergo constriction. So uh, these st advanced stages are the ones which are more of a management challenge. And uh, oh, yes, yeah. there have been various agents, hyaluronic acid, placentrex. Uh, really, uh, unfortunately, nothing has been shown to be foolproof. And that is the reason we have so many agents yeah. which come into... So that's uh, a point studies. I wanted to make out. Ma many of these medical injection managements are on not of long-term use. Uh, Dr. Ashok, uh, any experience with uh, placentrex, hyaluronidase or all those things? Ashok? Yeah. Okay, okay. Sorry, I uh, don't use this thing. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I have seen uh, quite few dental practitioners, uh, dental surgeons they use and they claim to have some good reason. You're a surgeon, also, but, but you don't believe in all this. Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, because basically those patients whom I see in my clinic, basically they come in the very late stage and uh, particularly the, the, the kind of patient you have shown in the picture. So unfortunately, I miss those early stage the, uh, disease patient and, right. and this patient who oh, comes no. to me yeah. in an advanced stage, they really need yeah. surgical intervention. Right. Pavan, uh, yes. uh, how do you manage uh, surgically these cases? Yes, sir, uh, I, I've tried coronodotomy, coronodectomy. I've tried with the nasal flaps, even SSGs. Yeah. Then uh, when I saw the presentation of Dr. Mutan Kapre once during our FHNO, yeah. I started using that uh, mandibular mucosal flap. And that is, I yeah. think yeah. that is very good after doing a laser uh, uh, mucosotomy in uh, oral submucous fibrosis. Do with laser, make a Y with the laser, yeah. then in that space, fill this mandibular yeah. mucosal flap. It works well. Yeah. Right. Uh, laser flap, I've, I'm not using much because it gives a lot of cosmetic deformity there on the face. Yeah. And the third thing, what we could do is if it is too much grade three, four, and the patient is willing or the facilities available, like at your center, I'll go for bilateral or maybe unilateral radial forearm flap. Right. So the um, uh, essence is that if it is, uh, if uh, subcutaneous fibrosis is uh, um, severe enough, you'll have to go for a surgical management. And of course, as the previous speaker told, there, there has to be a lot of motivation. He, has been, he was using the word motivation again and again. There has to be motivation from the patient to uh, undergo these exercises and so on. And in such patients, we can we have to do uh, surgical management with the release and some sort of uh, interposition uh, 
aircraft. So the malignant transformation rate is about 7 to 13%. Uh, we have to uh, counsel regarding cessation of habits, uh, correct nutritional deficiency, mouth opening exercises, subcutaneous injections like hyaluronidase, collagenase, placental extract, not of much benefit, and surgical removal of fibrous tissue and uh, use of uh, tissue graft. And that brings us to the end of uh, this panel. Thank you can, can all for this point? excellent contributions. Any any other point. last points from all of you? Any other can, last? Can I make a comment? Yes, Pawan. A yes. small comment. Yes. For self examination, uh, Dr. Dina was talking about what yeah. we do is I teach my patients to go ahead for three finger examination. You yeah. just three put your finger. Finger what is that? The mouth. See to it. Just put in your three fingers like that? this. Like this, yeah. you put in three fingers among your teeth. If it is openable to that extent, yeah. that means there is nothing like that. Or and if you advise them to see again and again inside the mouth, they might come with anxious anxiety problems again. So I think it should be done with moderate uh, guidance. Exactly. You know the four finger mouth opening, as we say, that the restricted opening in every patient. So uh, so that's that's one of the things what I talked about, and one of the early things that can be easily told because the patient does cannot uh, has a restricted mouth opening. Doctor Krishna Kumar, if I may say something, you have been an excellent uh, quiz master, and I think you took this uh, panel discussion to a great height. And thank you so much. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you so thank very you. much. Thank you, Dr. Mitesh Patel. Any 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 last point to add? I mean, I'll just request all the uh, panelists to for anything to add. Uh, Mitali, you yeah, have so something to add? Yeah, if you can stop the screen share, it would be easy for we can give the space there. Yeah, thank uh, you, sir. Sure, sure. Yeah, Mitali, continue. Yeah, so uh, uh, oral potentially malignant are disorders and they're not just lesions. So take care of it in total by giving a holistic counseling as far as habit cessation is concerned and a cure of the irritant factor, mainly dental in origin. Very good point. Very nice point. Uh, Ashok. Ashok, your last point. Ashok Das. Akshat, Akshat. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess Something we have already summarized quite well. Uh, I would also add on that all these patients, they have a, in spite of what you do, such lesions may come back and they might even progress. So patients need to be aware of that and they need to be cautious about it. Okay. Dr. Reena, any, any last points? Uh, what we would say is that uh, the, uh, that I would implore that every doctor has to be, every medical person, every person in every person's clinic has to be talking to the patient about habits because prevention is the way to go. And uh, unless we have uh, well-educated and well-aware uh, people managing our clinics and ourselves, I think we cannot manage our patients very well. And the mouth opening is one of the simplest ways to check yeah. good habits and talking to people and finding out what is it that uh, maybe Shruti, you're here. Would you like to show us the Triscare? I don't have it other than I've shown it just now. Yes, I think this is one of the things that I was talking about. So this oh, is a yeah. simple one that we have. So probably every clinic having one of these, equipping, equipping it with this, such that it's very simply that the patient just places it in the mouth, gauges how much is the mouth opening and turns it around by himself or herself and is able to open the mouth and then keeps it and can be collapsed and taken. That's a reading which can be put in. So I would suggest that uh, I think it's very important that we go the prevention way and uh, yeah. education, prevention, talking, not just for ourselves, our patients, but every person in the clinic. And uh, be a uh, two AR, if not a five A person. <laughs> right. Mitesh, uh, you have been missing for some time. Mitesh, is he back? Thank you, Shruti. Any Thank you. Mitesh, anything to add? And... Lastly, Dr. Riti Akarwal, our pathologist. What is advice to all these big surgeons? Riti Akarwal, your last uh, point. She has not been able to join, so she's not here actually. She couldn't join back. Okay. And the radiation oncologists are also not here. So thank you very much. That was an excellent panel. Thank you. Thank you. I can care, Dr. Vikram and all the organizers. Let's all give a round of applause to Dr. Krishna Kumar. I think he's been fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that was a wonderful panel discussion. And before we uh, say goodbye to everyone, I think we'll have a concluding remarks from Dr. Somesh Chandra. 
Over to you, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. You're audible. Yeah, I thank all today's speakers and uh, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar for uh, an excellent conduct of the panel. And uh, I think uh, Shruti and you and everyone uh, who's been busy uh, getting people registered and sending out messages about the event, you've done a fantastic job. We had more than 200 people uh, attending the sessions. Uh, and, and that in COVID times, I think, to have so many people together is, is a great achievement. Uh, it's like uh, any large national meeting of a prestigious organization. And uh, I'm sure that FHNO uh, would appreciate that uh, bringing different platforms together uh, definitely works uh, in the interest of everyone. And uh, this has given us a, a very uh, important message that if we bring the multiple disciplines together, how much more we can achieve and how much more meaningful and multidimensional we can make our meetings. Thank you. Over to you, Shruti. For anything otherwise, we'll say goodbye. I think it was a great discussion, excellent speakers and extraordinary uh, learnings, I must say. And I hope my participants also enjoyed on all the forums. Mr. Sharisha, this is a Triske, a wonderful, a simple device, a mouth opening device, which has been designed for submucosal fibrosis management. Very simple to use as well because it has to be rotated, simply rotated from bottom and then the pressure is ele elevated. So simply it can be rotated from the bottom and the mouth opening works and the protocols are very simple as well. And there is a scale here. So the reading also becomes very simple. So the link has been dropped on. Uh, I'll request everyone to please have a look at this device because I feel that this is going to be very, very beneficial for all the patients uh, out there. Other than that, I, I hope that uh, all the questions were answered and everyone enjoyed and loved being part of this uh, session today. It's day one and I'm sure the energy, the tempo is set. It's very high. And uh, the upcoming sessions are again filled up with a lot of, lot of energy and a lot of dexterous topics. And uh, 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 I mean, uh, unmatched uh, surgeons are with, with unmatched potentials and dexterity coming us and addressing us. So stay tuned. If there are any questions, please feel free to drop us those questions on the, either the feedback link or on social media. And we will try to get the answers from the panelists for all your questions. If you have any comments or suggestions, please do write to us at info at the rate uh, I can care dot in. And we will see you again next Sunday on day two of the e-conclave at the same time, 4 p.m. with more topics, with more discussions and uh, 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 more things to take away. I'll now invite uh, uh, Reena, ma'am, uh, because she has something Do to say. Dr. Pooja, you were just amazing. Thank you for holding this through. And you were just fantastic. Thank you for doing this for us and making it, it was so excellent. wonderful. No, it was excellent team work and I think all the uh, speakers and the uh, panelists did a wonderful job and I look forward for more involvement, especially being the radiation oncologist, I look, in for, uh, look for my involvement more in the clinical part. So see you next Sunday, uh, sharp 4 p.m. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And before uh, we end, I would request we have got still 123 people here. I'm just giving the link of our community page. Please, I would say that ki just join the community page so that we will be connected. We will, uh, the things that we have learned today will go on for long and it can be, it's, uh, we can have it, uh, means we can reach out to more people through that. So this is the community page. It will just take 30 seconds. And uh, I request every one of you, please do join the community page right away so that uh, don't leave it for the later period. Let us do it right away so that I can see the community page and people are joining in. Thank you so much. A lot of people are still joining in. Yeah. yeah. So we have got 63 members who have joined in right now. And I thank you so much. And uh, I will look forward for every, all others to join also if we have not yet joined. So what we are going to do, we will put these questions on the community page so that you can come on, you can discuss this thing there. 
then all the videos that we had had today of the wonderful session, each video would be uh, given the link there on the community page. So that way uh, we can transmit or we can reach to more number of people even after the uh, today's session is over. So today we had approximately 423 people on the Zoom. Of course, some of the people had uh, dropped off and we had a lot of people on the Facebook as well as on the live, uh, on the YouTube live, almost like on the Facebook, we had around 223. And on the live session, on the YouTube live, we had 124 people. So that was a wonderful session. I think uh, congratulations to the whole team and thank you for the faculty moderators and the chairperson. And special thanks to our uh, Dr. Anil D. Cruz, uh, Dr. Pandya, Dr. Somesh Chandra, Dr. Alok, and of course, uh, Dr. Harit Chaturvedi and the whole team who had worked together. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next Sunday at the same time, 4 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.